So we, we were here before, and so it's really nice to be back. And uh, I think when we thought about coming this time, we wanted to sort of maximize the interaction. I mean, we'd like to share with you as much as possible of what we've learned over the years. So I think to do that, it's not really effective for us to just show you a PowerPoint and just lecture up here and you guys have to listen and maybe fall asleep. Uh, so what we think is a better way to do it is we're going to talk, just talk, so be comfortable, ask questions, that's really the best way. And then we'll pull up uh, sort of information on the PowerPoint that we have to support what we're talking about. So Penny's really... She actually can read my mind, so before, it'll probably be up on the screen before we even finish talking about something. So we're just working out, uh, we're just moving over a few of the PowerPoints that we have just to go through and discuss things. So I just want to let you know that that's, I think, the best way. I hope you agree with that, because I do think that's the best way to actually learn. So everybody should relax, ask any question. It does not matter how basic you think it is or how complex it is, just ask it. It doesn't even have to be limited to ventilation. I mean, I'm happy to share with you all the, all the great hairs I have off many years we've been doing ICU stuff. And I know you guys have a busy ICU, so we're happy to talk to you about that. Penny's been an ICU nurse for years and uh, quite knowledgeable, and she can help me out with you know, things that are related more to nursing. So I think we have some nurses here, right? Do we have nurses here? Yes. We have nurses here. Uh, so, how about it? Who wants to go first? Or do I pick on you? <laughs> Let's see. Yes, perfect. I think I'll the residents. Um, so, I guess for when you're looking at a patient or and trying to determine their initial death mode, who's a good candidate for ARB? Like, in your mind, what do you look at? How do you decide? Yeah, so, you know, I think, I mean, that's a legitimate question. I would just tell you that, uh, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question. Really. So, and the reason why that's the wrong question is, you know, when I, when I think about APRB, you know, a lot of people think of modes by their acronyms. APRB, Airway Pressure Release Ventilation. Now, you know, technically, all modes have airway pressure, right? And all modes at some point go to release the pressure. That would be a tidal volume. So all modes are APRB, really. I mean, to some extent, the acronym is, is really, it falls short of understanding what you're trying to do with the lung. So let me just kind of explain how my brain thinks about this, about ventilation. So I've been doing ventilation for so long that what I've come to realize is I'm not really interested in the ventilator that much. What I'm more interested in is how I can manipulate the behavior of the lung to be the least injurious and to function optimally. So if you're going to do it that way, what you'd want is all the controls that you need to manipulate the behavior of the lung. And that's why APRV is really, it gives you all those controls. So I'm not sort of stuck on some standard settings. What I would tell you is if you were to throw a, the worst COPD patient at me, I'm not going to set them up like an ARDS patient. But because it's APRV, which by the way, we've decided to rename this, if you must know. It's actually, we published a couple papers on this. What we call it, because we were sitting in the lab one day, Say, you know, the APRB just really stinks as well. What would be a better way to describe the unique qualities of APRB? So, what we did was we came up with this term. It's not a particularly great term, but we call it TCAV Time Controlled Adaptive Ventilation. Why? Because, you know, the unique part of APRB is really time. So, when I'm trying to answer your question, I'm not thinking of should I put this patient on APRB and this, this APRB is better here versus there? What I'm going to do is try to manipulate the ventilator so that I can sort of make the lung work what I think is better. So I'm always thinking about the lung, not the ventilator. In fact, I hate the ventilator, to be quite honest with you. The ventilator is just a, a, a tool that I need to sort of support the lung. So I'm going to try to understand that. Now, why time? You know, technically, that's the secret of APRB. Time. That's it. Why? Because the lung is actually a very time-dependent organ. And so we're actually just exploiting that. That is probably the only thing that's unique about APRB, is that I can control time within milliseconds, and they're not stuck together like a rate knob. You know, if you change the rate, you change both inspiration and expiration. So we've taken that apart. That's what I mean by the five controls. I want those controls, 
you know, like if you're listening to music, you want you don't want just you know one knob. I mean, if you're a aficionado of music, you might want to adjust more than one, and you might need that to get this, the right sort of harmonic tone you want. Maybe that's a bad analogy, but that's how I see the PRD. So it may not be a great way to answer. I would say in general, the way we've been sort of teaching and applying it for the most part is for patients that have acute restrictive lungs, which are lungs that are edematous, lungs that are collapsed, like your post-operative patient. Your patient gets resuscitation, because we know when you get resuscitated, your lungs kind of shrink a little bit. It's very effective for, for that. And so that, that's what we do. Initial settings are, you know, if you're using conventional ventilation, uh, we can get into those details right now. We could talk about how you would actually transfer the patient over. But I would have to say, other than the unfamiliarity of it, you're going to do mainly what you do with any mode. What do you do with any mode? You sort of guess. You guess. You look at the patient. You look at the monitor. You look at the ventilator. You, you know, you do this, and then you say, okay, this is right. It's really not going to be any different. Now, at some point, I do want to get into a, a better, because I want you to understand the concept behind it, which is in order to do that, you have to understand what I was talking about, about the time dependent. So time control to control the time. And then there's an adaptive part. Why is there an adaptive part? Because we just found out 70 years ago, sorry, that if you take long and you inflate it and you let it deflate passively, the way the gas comes out of the lung, see the lung talks to you when it exhales, not during inhalation, during exhalation. So you gave the breath, and now the machine's gonna get now the lung is gonna give you the breath back. And if you pay attention, that is going to tell you the state of the lung. And there's the, the adaptive part. You know, when we use PEEP, for example, you guys use PEEP, right? How do you know how much PEEP to use? You know, PEEP's older than most of you guys in this room. PEEP is more than 50 years old. Okay. All right, so I'm excluded from that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we still don't know how to, how to set PEEP. How do you set it day one, day two, day three? What if the patient gets worse? What if the patient gets better? Oxygenation does not correlate with what you should do with PEEP as far as the behavior of the lung and whether it's safe or not safe or whether it's going to be injured or not. There's a bunch of data on that. So we still struggle, and that's where the adaptive ventilation comes in because we get real time monitoring and we'll go over real time monitoring. But what information, there's a lot of information when you set the patient on EPRD that you get. Uh, and that's why it's called what we call time controlled adaptive ventilation. That is the protocol within APRV. APRV, the mode being, it gives you all the controllers that you need to adjust. I hope that answered your question. Well, and I think to, to go with patient selection, I think the interesting part is, just like with this, that APRV, because it doesn't have a trigger, you know, for spontaneous breathing, that you're going to be able to sculpt the patient's breath and their spontaneous breath. And you'll be able to see what work they're doing. So you'll be able to see if they're working too hard or uh, to actually get air in or defend their lung volume and actually push air out. So I, I mean that you know the waveforms are very, very helpful there, which you can't really discern with PEEP because PEEP blocks, right? So it's a, it pinches the valve at the end expiratory. So it's very hard to tell what's going on. And this actually gives you a clear picture of the lung. Do you have a couple of spring animations? Um, so maybe you can pull that up. I know there's a question back here. Let me ask, answer your question while we're pulling up something that I want to show you about time. You know, the blues figures or something. Oh, that's true. That's a disadvantage, yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, some of this stuff isn't in the PowerPoint. That's, you know, that's why where Penny just pulls stuff up. She's got all this stuff on her computer. She just pulls it up. But anyway, I think you had a question. Me, sir? No, I could have sworn your hand went up. I think we asked you. Oh, no. Norton. Okay. Well, I had a question about COPD patients uh, sometimes with traumatic chest injuries. What's the proper way to actually uh, manage a patient that we place on the ERP that are COPD patients? Do you want to pull that up? Okay, that's perfect. Here you go. All right, so let me just explain uh, a little bit about this patient. <coughs> oh, there's the. Well, actually, if you don't mind, let's talk about this for a second so you understand the time-dependent behavior of the lung. 
So what we and by the way, we published something in the Journal of Applied Physiology. I'm sorry, flipped over, but you can that's okay. Um, and it will give you the reference, but all the uh, videos here are available for you to download and use them. It's it's actually reviewing how the lung really behaves. There's a lot of misconceptions about the lung from anatomy and physiology. And you can ask Dr. Shepard, if you don't know your anatomy, are you going to be a good surgeon? If you don't want a surgeon that doesn't know their anatomy, I promise you. But the same thing, if we get the anatomy wrong, everyone thinks that the lung is a balloon on a stick. It's not a balloon on a stick. Its physiology is completely different. So we go over all this in this paper. I think it came out two years ago or a year and a half ago. But this is what I want to show you about what's time dependent. Let me just explain this to you. So this is a, what we call it's just the conversion. All right, let me just try to explain it. So let's say I've got that spraying dashboard here, and you see all the little dots there? Let's say that's oil or honey or whatever. What happens if I go and pull on the handle? What happens to the plunger? Does anything happen to the plunger? It doesn't move right away, right? The energy goes into the spring, okay? And then, as the energy is stored in the spring, it pulls up the dash bond. That's that what happens. Better. Yeah, so that, that's what happens. So when you exhale, so that's inhalation. When you exhale, you let go. The spring goes like this, but it does not transfer into it. So that's, a, that's the viscoelastic behavior. Look, the lung is not elastic. Like a balloon, it's a viscoelastic. This is what's, what viscoelastic behavior means. Now, why is this important? It's important. Because when you try to inflate someone's lung, there's a time lag between here and when it finally reaches its final destination. And that's what we're exploiting. I'll turn on the mic off, please. Mm -hmm. That's it. We're exploiting that. So we can let go to get a tidal hunt without the lung moving. So in other words, we don't get collapse and re-expansion. And we can hold the lung because when we hold enough time, Without adding pressure, we're just using time, so you get more recruitment. Do you want to show your rat lung? Let's, let's just look at the rat lung. We're You guys have to conventional, conventional respiratory time, one second, is that reasonable for an adult? Generous. Yeah, even a little less, right? Well, let's give you a little. I won't have you about the 0.2 seconds. You can have that for free. Now take a look at. Uh, reversed. Oh, they're reversed. Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, so probably didn't transfer the. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, well, can, I can, can I you can play find it? Can you play it so that. So what we want to show you is that basically in one second nothing happens. You're still stuck in the big airways. So your tidal volume hasn't even reached the distal airspace. Actually, uh, this is what happens in one second, right here. And then this is what happens ever. Uh, so by two seconds, we get this major recruitment. So that's why, you know, ideally... Yeah, the, there's you know, five seconds right there. Five yeah, seconds. so five seconds is, and you get recruitment as it continues. Now we want to use time instead of pressure. You, can, you don't want to blast the lung open, you want to sort of coax the lung open. So there's the difference between a little over one second and So if you never get there, you ne you're just stuck in the airway. You never get out of it. So that's why the time on the inspiratory side is important. Because we want to take that, again, when I pull up that spring, nothing happens in the distal part. There's a little time lag. We are taking advantage of the viscoelastic behavior of the lung, which has a time lag in it. That's it. Both on inspiration and expiration. That's APRV. That is the essence of APRV. That's what's unique about APRV. Otherwise, it's the same old everything else like every other mode. That's it. And so here what they did was they looked at the different um, uh, modes of ventilation. So you have volume and you have pressure. And it takes two and a half seconds for the pressure from the ventilator to equilibrate with the yeah. pressure in the lung. So that, that curved line is alveolar pressure. And the straight line is what you'd see on the ventilator. The, the, the big square line. Yeah. So you can see the motors, they don't meet right away. Just because of that viscoelastic behavior. It's not a simple balloon inside each chest. Because there's tubes and a bunch of other things. And actually, it's more like a honeycomb. The lung is actually very much like a honeycomb. It's not 
separate balloon walls. They're actually integrated within each other. So they share walls. So that becomes uh, quite important. So this has been validated mathematically. There's actually a couple other. We work with a group in the University of Vermont with a bunch of mathematical computations on some very sophisticated computer algorithms. And they, they, they took the biological data and matched it to mathematical computation. This is the behavior of the so, so that's what we would do. Now, you have a lot of room to play with that T, T high. And so just understand that you know, we frequently talk about five seconds. Five seconds is probably optimal. Uh, for a patient that's not sick, you know, obviously if you have a patient that's really sick, you might need to ventilate them more because they don't have good lungs yet. You want to get their lungs better. So it may take hours before their lungs really improve and stabilize. In the meantime, you still have to ventilate them. So in an adult, you want to stay at least two seconds if you can. Uh, have I used less? Yes. And the T low will always help you, depending on how you set that. But that's, I just wanted you to understand what the uniqueness of it here is. Now let's talk about COPD. First thing I would tell you is that COPD is one of the most abused diagnoses that we have. Anyone who gets short of breath goes to the emergency department, gets an inhaler, will say they have COPD. You know, the proper way to diagnose COPD is pulmonary function testing. That's the proper way to do it. So, in the literature, you find that a lot of people get this label. They don't actually, have not been properly diagnosed. They could have had a little heart failure, and that's why they were short of breath and coughing. Or they had a flu, post viral uh, airway disease, and they were short of breath and they got an inhaler. So, many people, just because it says it on the chart, does not actually mean that you have COPD. And the reason why I say this is because what's unique about EPRV, even though we ge I generally don't like to talk about COPD and EPRV, just because if you most people take the settings that we normally talk about, which is a different disease, you know, the lungs are small and you're trying to keep them from collapsing. Here in COPD, the lungs are big and you want to make them smaller. So our task is totally different. So imagine that. Our ventilator settings would be totally different. So what people do sometimes is they take the EPRV settings that we normally talk about, because that's the bulk of the application, take those, and so it would be like Dr. Shepard using the same incision to do a totally different operation. It just wouldn't make sense. If, if you need this operation, that's what you need, not the same old operation. So just understand that you would have to set the, the you would have to set it quite differently. So because the way you determine if someone has COPD is pulmonary function testing, you do something called a, uh, their uh, FEVC, their forced vital capacity, and you look at the time, FEV1, how much air they can get out. Why? Because they have a problem getting air out of their lung. Now, we sort of do that with APRB. We get to look at their peak flow. And because we haven't said anything on the ventilator, we get to see how fast air comes out of your lung. And we can take a look and see, and we can diagnose airflow obstruction or airflow limitations. So we get patients that have COPD, quote unquote, but their flow pattern looks totally different. It looks like a regular person because they don't have the same mechanical properties. So you can't hide your mechanical properties on EPRV. On conventional ventilation, you can because you, the lung is trying to talk to you. It's trying to give you the information back, and it bumps into a peak valve, and it goes. So all that information gets stopped at the, at the peak valve, and you just get a little sort of trickle of gas afterwards. So it's like pinching your, your finger on a balloon. You're not looking at the energy of the balloon and how the balloon sort of pushes the air out. What you're looking at is the airflow after your finger. You're not even thinking about the mechanics of the balloon. You're looking at how much squeezing of your finger. That's it. So anytime you add peak, you completely distort this diagnostic information. This diagnostic information is not only useful for that, but it also tells you what happens to your patient. And I'll show you an example of it. So this is a lady. Can you back to the x-ray? This lady over here, right? That's somebody else. That's somebody else. That's somebody but I've else. got her so comparison. Just, just ignore this. So this is a classic hyperinflated patient with what you would think is COPD. Now the x-ray findings are linked. All our function tests can detect these kinds of problems much earlier. In fact, anyone just, here with asthma? Does anyone have asthma? Do you have a peak flow meter? Um, no. 
No one's ever given you a they, uh, I No. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. no. And we'll I'm have to talk after this. Terrible. Yeah, so, so you know, when, when, with asthma, if you have severe asthma, you absolutely have to use a peak flow meter. And the way we, we tell people to use it is you get up every morning, you have a little journal, yeah. and you go, and you blow into your peak flow meter, and you write down the number. Why? Because before you wheeze, before you even start to feel bad, your peak flow starts going down. Okay, so why why have a full blown asthma exacerbation where someone might want to intubate you when anything sort of catch you ahead of time? And That's I, the value. Of, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so sorry, I'm not trying to. No, I just okay. want to take care of you well. <laughs> so, and, and I, I think to address your question and also to go back to yours is uh, picking the settings for the person. And that's why I, I kind of put that up there as far as diagnosing COPD per the chart. So it's labeled and stamped all over, and they have a bracelet, their COPD. But if you see the chest X-ray on the left, you are, chances are, 99.9% .9 absolutely not going to set the ventilator as if yes. she had COPD. You would set this as restrictive lung disease, Flat because right brain. now that's what she has. Yeah. However, if you saw that chest X-ray as soon as she got intubated, you would nowhere near set this for restrictive. You would set it purely for obstructive. And then the numbers are going to tell you. Yeah, so let me just explain what this patient looks like. This patient looks like this. And this is what a COPD -er would be doing. They'd be at total lung capacity with flat diaphragms. And they'd be walking around like this. And it's very hard to breathe in if you can't breathe out. And so Personally. their problem is they, their lungs are too big. And we want to help them breathe better by making their lungs smaller. So that trapped air is what we're interested in. Completely different from the x-ray penny showing you where Every time you let go, the lung want to, wants to collapse because the recoil force is so high. Think of recoil as a spring. And when you breathe, actually, you're pulling the spring apart and then letting it go. That's what you're doing. Your, your chest is actually doing this. That's what you're doing. Now, if that spring is really a thick spring, it takes a lot of energy. And when you let go, it wants to completely empty. Now, see over here, barely has a spring. I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing there. When they let go, nothing happens. So, you can see here... We'll show you, but the peak flow, this is artifact from, that's artifact from the circuit. But I can measure this patient's peak flow, and the peak flow here is just between 20 and 15. So let's make it 17. 17 minutes per minute. Now, normal is going to be 60 to 80. This is not a lot of air coming out. And as you can see, she's got COPD. And you can see the times are totally different. We don't need a long time to repeat the lung. Wait, the lung's already inflated. Why do we have to repeat the lung? Do you even see that two seconds or five seconds anywhere near? No. Same thing here. This is the right time to give you that roughly 50 to 25%, not 75%, because this is where this behavior is better. And we can get into why we come up with these times. But that's what you want to do. Now let me ask you guys something. If you have somebody with COPD, is it possible that we can make their COPD lungs worse, but not by, by making their COPD worse. Actually, we might make their COPD better. Is that possible to make their lungs worse and make their COPD better? Or am I just crazy? Or make their COPD go away temporarily. Because remember, the problem fundamentally is this person cannot inflate their lungs. It would be like you blowing up air in a paper bag and then letting go of the paper bag. It's still full of air. Oh, the balloon has recoil. You can have recoil, which is very little recoil. Can you believe so that's, the, that's the same patient. This is the same patient. Look at her. She looks more like now. It's still longer than we typically use, but now we're at 75%. Look at her peak flow. It's almost... It's just underneath. And I put I put up here because unfortunately we didn't capture the middle, okay? So here she's only got a peak expiratory flow rate of 20 liters, and then she's got a T low of 1.8. She's still going to take days to empty, right? I mean, you could set the T low to three seconds, and she probably still wouldn't empty. But in the middle of the night, well, I'll show you the chest x-ray. She got fluids. She got um, uh, her peak expiratory flow rate went up to 50 liters. Had we gotten the picture, this is what it would look like. She goes all the way to zero. Her angle, instead of being flat, becomes more acute. More, instead of uh, 90 degrees, becomes 20 degrees. And then now the t low has to be adjusted to capture and stop at 20 at 
Does that what? make sense? Can you see the, what would have happened in the middle? So what, what happened was this lady got a diva. She got a right diva. And we'll show you her x-ray. She got, not yet. Okay. But what happened was we changed from mechanics to, this would actually be a normal looking uh, flow pattern. Not even a severe ARDS pattern, which actually would require this number to be really uh, much shorter because this is related to how fast you empty. And this line right here, if you could just project this line, that's what I was talking about 70 years ago, 30 years ago, people figured out that the long tops can be an exhalation. And this slope is what we call elastics. What do you think of it as compliance? And so, see over years have more compliance. It has a different angle. When you have a lot of recoil, guess what? If your lung is really sick, it's not going to be like this. It's going to be like this. It's going to want to empty. I think you guys can relate to that, right? If the recoil force is up, like edema or collapse, that lung, as soon as you let go of that pressure, it just wants to go, totally collapse on itself. Versus a COPD lung, it's forever in the chest. So this, this is why we call it adaptive ventilation. Why? Because I can walk in the room and say, hey, what's wrong with this patient? That's not the same patient. What happened? Something happened. Oh, the endotracheal tube is obstructed. Or, you know, oh, she must have gotten fluid, and now she has restrictive lung disease. So now you can show the x-ray. Yeah, so you can project that if that TLO was still set in 1.8 seconds, that she would have completely emptied. So it would have returned to baseline. And then now you can so see. We, we use this. So she got fluid overnight. And uh, her blood pressure dropped, her output dropped. So they gave her fluid. And she's like 90 years old, which is fine, it's still the 90 year old's fluid. But she developed a deep, and it took her COPD and made her lungs more like a normal person, even though we gave her a lung edema. That, that's not how you want to normalize your lungs. In fact, there's data on COPDers when they gain weight, because that's a restrictive versus obstructive. So it actually lowers their lung volume. And so, again, that's not what we're trying to do, make you gain weight to, to fix your COPD. But I'm just pointing out the mechanical behavior of the lung is really different. And that's why that flow pattern with the adaptive ventilation part of what we call TCAP, we adjust the time according to the behavior of the lung. So we listen to the lung and we're adjusting the settings accordingly. So that's why it comes back to your original question. That's how I look at it here, I don't look at it as a mode. I look at it as a, all the things I need to manipulate to fix this problem. And if the problem evolves, is what happened to her? We diureased her, right? What happened to her flow? Do you have that? No, it went right okay. back to so 20. You, you, I know on, on your computer you have it. But it went right back to where she started from. We fixed her and we executed her. So then now, you, if you could imagine this, instead of the peak flow, instead of being 50 liters, it, it went down. And then at, for T lows 0.8 seconds, she had a box. Because she needed more time, right? So if this is 1.8 seconds and I stop it at 0.8 seconds, I need an additional second to let that air out. So there's no decay, there was no angle, it was just a box. That makes sense, and, and that's what I was saying. If your P low is set to zero, you don't have any interference, you don't have peak, you know, that you have to move aside to see what's going on in the lung. This actually gives you a true projection of what's happening in the lung. And that's why you can see, you can detect, I'll show you all kinds of uh, um, uh, wet HME, a suction catheter left down in the endotracheal tube, a kinked endotracheal tube. All of these are easily picked up by looking at your, um, your flow pattern. So these are, uh, Dr. Bashi was called to the room. There was quite a panic, desaturation, low tidal volumes. Everybody's flipping out. Everybody's looking at the ventilator. Well, I, I looked at the ventilator too, and I noticed that the patient was totally obstructed. Yep. It looked like they suddenly got COPD. So I know they didn't get COPD suddenly, so you look for obstruction. These are the things you just start putting together a little list of things that you should look for if you're using APRV and you see an obstruction. There are plenty of things to look for before you do this. Now, this was Dr. Bashi's um, uh, patient, giving away the 
but uh, th this was his patient probably about the time you were there that uh, um, you know everything looks good over here you got a nice 45 degree angle but there's a telltale sign that you can see look at all the ratty edges on the waveform you can see there's no decay right? again if you know that the energy out of something it's going to decay in a linear fashion in other words it wants to do it wants to do that it's not your peak, flow, your peak flow cut in half, it went from 80 down to about 40, and notice it turned into a box. It's a complete square. That's the patient with pulmonary contusion, severe pulmonary contusion. Yeah, and, and they were going to re-intubate, uh, you know, Dr. Bashi said we need to re-intubate, and everybody's like, the sats are fine, yep, the guy's doing fine, what's the big deal? Well, if you can imagine, they were passing a suction catheter, but go in, and nothing, nothing was coming out. So everything's fine, right? See, there's no secretions, there's nothing going on. That's an even worse sign because this is what happened when they reintubated him. And what was happening was it was creating a one-way valve. That was so encrusted with blood, you could forcibly push the catheter and it would part the seas, but then when you took the catheter out, it would close. Well, that's what was happening with the gas. So, so air was going in, not coming out. Going in, not coming out. So the patient... And the patient can, there's an open exhalation valve, so at least the patient can fight against it. It was pushing and pushing and trying to get air out because he was getting what he didn't want. Now remember, I didn't, I didn't see the magnitude when right. it came out. <laughs> but how did I figure it out? Right, so there's a lot of information there. And so even, if you look at even that. when you set up your patient initially, you can, you can at least look at that and determine, you know, what... What's happening to my patient? You know, when, let's say you have severe ARDS, it's going to be like this. And as their compliance gets better, it's going to do this. And you might have to adjust a few things. But even if you don't, because as Penny said, they can still exhale and route. It. And you can see do. here, the patient. But it's giving you information about the evolution of your patient. Because you know their lungs don't stay the same day one, day two, day three, right? Hopefully they get better. Sometimes they get worse. Well, that's what happens. I'll show you some spontaneous exhalations, but. When you, everybody take a deep breath and exhale, when does the largest portion come out? The beginning, right? So you should have peak and then it should decelerate. If you have a patient that flips that around and the peak is on the end, they're, they're pushing, right? I mean, that peak is on the end. So if you have someone who is forcibly exhaling, so he, Dr. Bashi added up all these signs, plus he remembered this guy has pulmonary control. That could possibly, you know, when they start breaking up, they create blood. Nothing's coming out of the suction tube um, of, of the ET tube. He's forcibly exhaling. He, you know, all these things reintubate, and you know, I didn't have to go in the room to figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, anesthesia. You know, they were oh, okay. Fine, I'll do it for you. You know, this is ridiculous. And then afterwards, he was like, Oh my God! <laughs> He's like, you know, how did you know? And he, Dr. Weiss said it was so easy looking at waveform when you start looking, reading waveform. Right, and, and again, I don't want it to be something I do. I want it for everyone to be fine because I'm telling you, you can save someone's life. We had a patient, we don't have an example in here, but it's the same. We're crying out loud, I was hibernating. Don't you guys ever take a pulse? So again, <laughs> assess your patient, right? And we had a patient came back from the OR, and this patient was, we were rounding, and uh, the nurse, from the other end of the ICU, uh, came up to us, interrupted rounds, and so we dismissed her right away. So we are rounding, you can't see the We listened to her, and she said, there's something wrong with the ventilator. And at job trauma, because most of the nurses know to look at these things, the nurse says there's something wrong with the ventilator and the waveform, you actually need rounds. So we, go. so we go, no airflow coming out of the patient. The patient can, can get a breath in, but nothing coming out. Pardon me? Say this patient's endotracheal tube was at the posterior wall of the trachea doing this. And so we pulled up the x-ray, we saw this, because during transport it moved. But basically the, the the only time you get air in was when you pushed the posterior wall of the trachea away and then it would flop back. And if we didn't fix that patient, there would have been a problem. Because air is going in, but nothing's coming out. You know, we're just doing it until the patient explodes, I guess. But So we got to the patient time and advanced the tube, everything was fine. And why did that happen? I mean, I would have gotten to that patient 
I mean, that patient was several beds away by the time you arrived at that patient. So, the more people you have sort of looking at these things, I think it's, it's better. And you don't, it's, it's like, what do you need to understand this concept? It's not that complex. Even I can do it. It's not that complicated. <laughs> this was so, the suction catheter left in the end Yeah, so take a look. I mean, this is, you have a visual representation, a visual representation. And if you happen to be careful enough where you document the peak flow on your patient, you can see if there's any changes in peak flow. Because I can tell you when the, when the lung gets worse, the peak flow goes up, and that angle goes like this because the lung empties a whole lot faster. So in this amount of time, one second, this whole lung is going to empty. See how it doesn't empty? Like it would take that much time to empty. Right? Completely empty. Well, if it empties in the first 0.5 seconds, that's someone who's, who's, whose spring has really gotten very stiff. And you need to make some adjustments. So again, this is a visual representation of what's, what is the behavior of the lung. And thankfully, we've come up with some ideas about where you should adjust it to, to get that lung stable. If we've done that clinically and experimentally to sort of help us understand where you need to set this to, to protect the lung the most. So here's another one. You uh, do your assessment, tidal volumes are 793, you can see all your settings, everything looks great, you got a perfect 45 degree angle, everything looks great. You go down, you have lunch, you check a few patients out, you come back and you see that on yeah, the so right. Just so in case you can't read the numbers here, this this blue line right here is 40, so the peak flow is 40. This is artifact from the circuit, so don't It was 80, yeah. it's now 40, yeah, your volumes are cut in half. So did your patient get an exacerbation of COPD? Probably not. Could be. We actually did have that the other day. And it was an exacerbation of COPD. But in this patient, no COPD. Um, uh, think of things that could happen. Okay, so you checked out the suction catheter. It wasn't buried in there. I looked at the endotracheal tube. That wasn't it. Uh, they didn't have pulmonary contusions. The thing was wet. All they did was change that out. Volumes go right back in. Remember, this is a big resistor, especially oh, when they get saturated in water. And that depends, I mean, that can happen within an hour. So you can, mirror, mirror, you know, create a miracle, right? And there. expiratory filters do the same thing. So, again, they'll just tell you when to change it because they add a lot of resistance to the circuit. Um, this is actually a weird anomaly. It's a reverse. So there's something kind of stuck in the endotracheal tube, and then the gas flow comes out and it stops. Then it accelerates. So if you look, you should look like this, right? Your peak flow should be on the left, and then it should decay. But if you look at the top one, the peak flow is on the right. So it decays, and it picks up speed. So as soon as we suctioned, it reversed. Yeah, here was a sort of partial or variable instruction. Those are just some examples. Um, of you know, kind of what to look for, like different things, but that that's really you, you're not going to see that peak. Peak, you know, pinches the valve, so it's not going to give you that clear picture of something obstructing. Yeah. So let's uh, let me just stop there. All the stuff there, and just see if there's any questions about anything we just discussed. Hopefully, we said it well enough for you. It's always difficult to take the right words sometimes. Any any questions about this? Maybe we've talked about it. Sure. Because we remember there is a, like a three page quiz. <laughs> I, did you tell me about the quiz? I did. So it's, it's a pretty tough quiz, too. So. Covers everything we're talking about. So. All right. Uh, let's move on then. What, what other questions? Who's got a question? Anyone? Flow rate you want to set, you want to ideally have at 75%? No, so we don't We don't get to choose that. That is the law. But when we're looking at the patient, an ideal peak flow rate would be. Well, so most patients, most normal patients, uh, will be like 60 liters, plus, 68 liters. You know, someone who's got a lot of recoil, let's say someone who's really sick, a bariatric patient is really sick because they have a lot of chest recoil, they might hit 100. Uh, COPD years are generally under, well under 50. Like severe COPD is going to be 10, 20, 30, 
that's, that's, so you know someone has an airflow limitation, whether they have asthma or something in the circuit. You know, we can't tell you exactly where the obstruction is, you know, but we know there's an obstruction, and obviously if the circuit's big, you know, so you're not looking, you're not picking a number per se, but for most of your normal patients that don't have a, a COV, it's going to be at least 60 liters. That's kind of sort of a minimum cutoff. And what, what we're trying to say is, if you know that, you can then monitor it, right? So if it does, so if this patient's peak expiratory flow is 64, and then all of a sudden it goes down to 59, and then the next day it goes down to, you know, 40, you know there's something wrong. Maybe their asthma's getting worse, something like that. Or just the opposite, let's say, um, patient's got a peak expiratory flow of 60, and Dr. Shepard takes the patient to the OR, they give them a lot of fluid, they do all kinds of stuff, the patient gets edema post-op, and because their abdomen is, you know, big and full of ascites, now the recoil of their chest is much faster. So instead of the peak flow being 60, he's going to come back with a peak flow of 70. And the angle's going to change, because the lung is going to empty itself a lot faster. And then you're going to have to adjust the T-low to achieve 75%. So I just want you to understand that we don't give you a number. So 75% for a non-COPD patient, 75% of the peak flow, which is right here. So basically, we're letting the gas come out. And here, we're, we're cheating a little bit by saying 100 liters per minute, just to make the math easy. So here, you let go of the pressure. Let go. Air comes out. Comes out very, very fast. And as the... As your chest and lungs start to lose energy, the flow is going to slow down. Right? So at this point, if we were to measure the flow, it's 75 liters. At this point, there's no flow. The, the thing's empty. Right? So we're not trying to let the lung completely empty. We're trying to get you a ton of volume so you can remove carbon dioxide and then stop you so you don't start collapsing the lung. This 75% is where your lung is very stable. More stable than 24 RP in terms of exhalation. We've done some studies to show that your, your alveoli are very stable. Your lung doesn't actually move, but you're able to ventilate. So we're trying to ventilate you without doing this to your lung, like conventional ventilation. Inflate, deflate. We're just trying to do this. Okay, so that's 75%. So that's protocolized, but it's not personalized. Why? Because it depends on you, right? So 75% could be that number. But if you're, like I said, if your patient gets sicker or better, let's say your patient gets better, instead of this angle, it's going to be like this. So they're no longer at 75%. They're at 90%. It's going to look like a box. So in order to get them back to 75%, that's what I have to do. I have to adjust this. And the opposite is true when the lung gets worse. It goes like this. That's all you're doing. So it's protocolized but personalized, which is exactly what you want. Because protocols don't force everyone to fit into it. But we need protocols because you know you have to have some you can't sort of do it differently on every patient. So this gives you the protocolized 75% of the peak expiratory flow of the peak expiratory flow. That's going to result in a different number that you set it to. And you're going to set it to that patient's lung not only right now, but later on. As they get better, as they get worse. That's the point. So I put up your three three T low settings with the same peak extratory flow rate. Okay? So the gas flow comes out of the lung, and then if the T low is set to 0.0, .0 of course, that would be CPAP. You would have spikes, right? Because there's no decay. There would at be all. So if you set it at 0.5 seconds, the gas flow starts to come out, it stops at 0.5 seconds and it goes returns back to baseline. If you do your math, 100, in this case you could take 75 divided by 100, that's 75%, right? So now, let's say we increase the T low to 0.6, you can see that it's 50% now. So it's half, see, here's the peak expiratory flow rate's 100, if you go up and this is 50, it matches with the termination on the right side, right? So if I keep increasing my T low to 0.7, it goes all the way down to 25%. And we actually did this um, uh, in the lab. This, this is actually what Dr. Bashi was talking about. If the angle changes, first of all, when you de-recruit, right? So he, like you said, Dr. Shepard took him to the OR, gave a lot of fluid. I use that example because 
I don't know how many years ago. That's when I first made this observation, by the way. And then I, of course, decided to read it. You thought it was good. I found it, you know, 70 years ago, people already figured it out. So I wasn't that smart. Someone else already figured it out. Keep talking, it's going to take a while. It's coming over. I have a piece, five nice. pieces. There we go. Yeah. On the, the P-escatory flow, because I'm not, I, under, I think I understand the concept a little bit, but I'm not understanding where the other flow is offloaded. So we keep, whatever, 25% in the lung to 75% in the lung to stabilize it, correct? Right, so what, what, okay. what that means is we're interrupting it. Okay. So what you're doing is interrupt it. You know, pretend I'll just use a balloon. Let's say I've got a balloon in my hand, right? Mm -hmm. And I take my fingers completely off and the balloon comes screaming, the air comes screaming out. And as the balloon loses energy, the, the tension on the wall, the balloon loses energy, the flow decays in a linear fashion. Just like that line you see there. At some point, if, if I don't pinch it again, it's going to completely empty. So this is where we pinch it. So I'm pinching it here. That means if I didn't, it would go to here and come to balloon the end. So the question I have is because the concept, I'm not understanding what's happening with this space there. Once you pinch it, what happened? What transpires? Oh, so what in happens the lung is we there? go back to reinflating the lung. We just start the breath again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so basically it looks like this. That's okay. it. So okay. this is the and then you're back to reinflating. Why? Because we don't if we keep going, if we persist along this path, and I don't know if you can show some, some collapse. Do, uh, yeah, okay. She'll show you what the lung looks like when you go beyond 75%. Okay. This is where the lung just completely empties. And you cannot see this, you cannot hear this, you can't pick this up with the blood gas. And this is what tears the lung apart. It's that collapse. Mm -hmm. Normally our lungs barely move. Your lungs don't move much. Even you know, with your tidal water, you don't move much. not at the alveolar space. You know, what happens is the airflow, as the air goes through the tubes, it's dividing the tree, the bronchial the tree gets smaller and smaller. The airflow is slowing way down. And so at, at this, at the alveolar level, there's no movement of the air. In fact, remember, when you take a breath, you are not blowing down the alveolar level. What you're doing is pushing the gas that's already in there that stays in there, you're just pushing it out a little bit. That's all you're doing. That's all you're doing. Not like you're replacing, you don't take a breath and you're going down the alveolar level. That doesn't make sense. You don't do that. There's only a few mammals that actually can, can do something even close to that, and that's, you know, mammals that die, like seals and whales. And they can actually empty the gases, residual gas in their lung, a portion of it, not all of it. And they exhale before they go diving for two hours. Because they're mammals, they have lungs, but they hold their breath a long time. So that's what we have to do to hold their breath. Thank you. So, so the, when your patient comes back from the OR, all of a sudden that angle that was 45 degrees with the T-lift set at 0.5 is now 20 degrees, right? So can you see the difference in the angle? So the angle was here, and it would take you know this long for the lung to completely empty. Now at 0.5 seconds, your this line here has moved up to here. So can you see that? So 45 degrees, it went like that. So that for the same 0.5 seconds, you're almost completely emptying your lung. So you have to take your T low, trim it back to 0.4 seconds, and now you're back to 75% before it stops, and then goes back up to baseline. And this patient's compliance is worse. And you know what? This example is exactly the first time I ever saw this. My patient went to the OR looking like this. It was a Dr. Shepard. Well, Dr. Shepard was probably... <laughs> In junior high school, <laughs> and then my patient came back looking like that. And we're like, why did they look like that? And I was like, well, let me try putting them back to this, and I used the time adjustment. Well, and everything got better. But but tell them though, everybody, everybody was set to a T low point eight. Everyone didn't matter what, and this is where seventy five percent came from, which was every time they came back from the OR, this changed. So you know, it's it, this is analogous to. You, your patient went to the OR on 15 of PEEP, and they came back on 5 of PEEP. That's what this is analogous to, because you, if your T-low is set inappropriately, you're losing your ability to keep your lungs recruited. It's a loose, you know, analogy of PEEP. You had a question? Yeah, I had a question, because I know that usually the practice you have is one floor is kind of like the east side, the east connect. 
But I can see where what you're saying, where that 25 is asking because there's probably some type of like, email you know, and all that. So I'm using that back up to 25%. So obviously, you decrease your two goals to actually try to hopefully it up some more. Yeah. How safe or how, how long is it safe you know, to keep that 24? It'll tell you. The law will tell you. Why? Because this will, so you see how this returns 75%. Let's say it recruits. So 0.4 seconds, if we just envision, this is 0.5 seconds. 0.4 seconds, let's say, is here. Now your your pick expert, your termination is 85%. It's not 75% anymore. And this will look like a box. Eventually, this will look like a box. That's someone who is doing the opposite of you. Well, recruiting. it's interesting They're what you're recruiting. asking because this is really interesting. So you use the word, is it safe to use a number, 0.5 or 0.4? It's 75%. That may be 0.35. It may be 0.3. We've used that in adults. It's 0.3. Yeah, but that's but, someone um, who's super But the question super is, good. that I have is, what do you mean by unsafe? What would be unsafe well, about that number? For me, you know, obviously, yes. Yeah. So giving that, that release time, enough release time to go up. So it's safe to keep it. Very good. So you're talking about yes. ventilation. You're talking, you're talking about, about ventilation. Yep. Yep. ventilation. Yeah. Yeah. Because Very but good. But do remember one thing. You guys have ever heard the baby loan concept? Yeah. Low, low tidal volume strategy? How do you figure out the tidal volume for the patient? Six ml per kg based on what? Ideal body weight. Ideal, 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 ideal body weight. Well, you know ideal body weight has nothing how bad your lung disease is, does it? What if you're identical body weight, and I have mild, you have more severe, or you have moderate, I have severe, you have mild. So body weight was a compromise. You know the, the original baby lung data, what it was related to? What? And if you look at something called driving pressure, that's exactly right. Driving pressure is how to normalize tidal volume for compliance, because we know that if you go exercise, for example, you can have huge tidal volumes. Your tidal volumes during exercise are three and a half liters plus lung volume exploded because your lungs are normal, normal compliance. So this is really basically, see this area under this triangle? Flow, flow is here on the y-axis, time. Flow over time is another way to say volume. You know, like if I pour something in, flow, uh, how long the time? I can fill it up. That's how they fill up your Coke can in this factory. It's volumetric flow over time. This is your tidal volume. Look, when the lung gets sick, I don't pick the tidal volume. The lung does. In fact, when we rescue patients, the tidal volume is frequently less than five. Because that's a made up number. This is related to this patient's lungs at this moment. And if you shorten that T low because the lung wants to empty faster, that means the compliance is worse. That means you need a small tidal volume. That means instead of guessing based on body weight, you're going you're gonna to set it to mechanics. This is the original concept. The original big lung, the residual size of that lung correlates in almost a perfect linear fashion. I don't know if you have that. Anymore. You have that thing? Baby lung data, the original baby lung from the 80s, yeah, 80s 70s. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's compliance. When the lung gets healthier, you can have a bigger tidal volume. When the lung is sicker, you can't have a big time. And I'm telling you, this sometimes this is four MLs. Now, what you're going to have to do is bulk ventilate more, so you can shorten your T high. So don't don't get stuck on that T high of five, which is basically giving a rate of ten, which is the perfect thing for your post-operative patient or someone who's got mild lung disease. It's not for the patient that you're contemplating ECMO on. You know, you might have to use a T high. You know, I'd say at a one or one point five. That's not ideal, but I tell you, if you set this right, the lung will recruit into a position for you to take it to that next step. So as long as you get this right, the lung will kind of fix itself. It will perpetuate its recruitment. So that's why this, I would just tell you, this is the most important thing in your care. And if you don't do this, you're going to hurt the patient. You know, experimentally, when we, when we do this, we published a paper. Um, where we're, I'll just tell you, what we did was we took two two groups of pigs, and we decided to use, these are normal lungs, these pigs, and what we decided to do was use a bronchoscope, and then we put tweed in their lower parts of their lungs, the lower lungs, 
food as a, as a detergent that actually breaks uh, surfactant, makes the lung very unstable, just a terrible injury. And so we created a baby lung, which is here, and a disease lung here. That's what we did. That's the model. And then immediately we put the, the animals on 40 centimeters of water, right off the bat. So their airway pressure was 40. Because we wanted to hurt the baby lung, right? You can agree with that, right? 40 is a lot. Hurt the baby lung, and the only thing we decided to do was adjust the TLO to either this or this. And then we, we decided to wait and see what would happen. So both groups got 40 centimeters. What do you think the baby lung would look like, the non injured lung, the healthy lung? Which, which lung was worse? Which group was worse? This is the healthy lung, not the disease lung. Remember, they're both getting 40 centimeters of water. Just guess, okay? You can still have a cookie. Just because you have a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 so the baby lung was, in the 25% was destroyed. They remained healthy in the 70%. Now let's talk about the disease lung. You know, that's where the lung is collapsing in. So obviously there's less opening and closing, less collapse with this, a lot more with this. The disease lung, which one looked worse? The 75% looked a lot better than this. So, 75, so a lot of the information that's sort of coming to bear <coughs> is that it's really the opening and closing that creates this problem. And it's not as simple as baby lung, healthy lung. That's the wrong model. The model is actually now, and you can't show that. Uh, can you show the stress riser data? Yeah, Sorry. Anyway, let me try to describe it. Uh, can we show? Let's try, I'll just draw it. Okay. Here. Oh, I'm just going to move this. Can, can you guys see this? Okay, so I'm going to try to show you what the lung really looks like, the anatomy of the lung. So the anatomy of the lung, like I said, more is more like a honeycomb. So this is what the lung really looks like. And more importantly, you have what we call shared alveolar walls. And to date, no one has ever been able to show the lung can over the stem. That's actually very hard to create over the stem. If you think about a balloon, yes. And actually, when you take a big breath, what do you think is happening in your lung? When you take a big breath, you have two choices. The, the alveoli that are open get bigger, or you get more of them. What's, which one do you think it is? Bigger. Ones that are open get bigger. Do you guys all agree with that? Okay, that's wrong. <laughs> so you actually gain more alveoli. That's what you do. When you do this, your lung grows, and it's just you have a bunch of little alveoli on reserve. They just keep popping up, and that's it. You actually, your alveoli gets smaller when we go to total lung capacity. Yeah. And that's because they're not balloons on a stick, they're cubicle. Now, again, the, the classic sort of example of this is the a CAT scan, this is the spine, this is the sternum. So this is the baby lung and this is the diseased lung. And this is all the white and so on. So the whole idea is to protect this normal healthy lung. And it's more more non-dependent. That's sort of the anatomy of this. But the anatomy is actually incorrect. The anatomy is that when when you have, uh, you can't really overinflate this lung. You can't overinflate this lung. What you need to do is to take this lung unit here, this alveoli. This alveoli shares a wall with all of these. See that? So when I collapse this one, let's say I start to collapse this one, I'm going to do this. <coughs> and on this side, I'm going to do this. And this one's going to do this. And this one's going to do this. And this one's going to do this. So this one starts to fold right here. You see how it elongates the walls of its neighbors? So it's not over distension, recruitment, de recruitment. That's based on CAT scans, which can't, they don't actually give you information at the alveolar level. So there's some much more sophisticated scanning techniques now helium, uh, MRIs, uh, dual energy uh, paired CAT scans. There's a bunch of these new techniques, most of them experimental. But what they show is that 
there's an area here, and an area here, and an area here, and an area here. It's, it's not sort of confined to good, bad. They're scattered everywhere. And if you look, this is what it is. Once you start creating collapse of the lung units, then you get overdistension. So you saw that you overdistension collapse. This propagates injury here. And right at the scene where you have healthy lung and abnormal lung opening and closing is where you destroy the lung and then you get a new layer to destroy and then you get another new layer to destroy. You just keep marching until you do that. So that's the latest science on what actually happens. What were the baby lung ideas back in the 80s? So, I mean, the thought process is refined quite a bit. But this is important because your, your lung is like a tiny part. And it's interdependent. Why it's it's very difficult to overdistend the lung, and why it's actually hard to collapse the lung is because of the structure. This is what we call alveolar interdependence. In other words, we're all like holding hands, right? And you're not going to let me fall, so you hang on to me, right? And if we have to push against each other, if we push against each other in the same amount, then we don't change our position. It's only when one of us says that all of you start to fold. So this is what makes the lung ultimate unstable. And you start to get collapse, and then you get overdistension. In other words, you can't have overdistension unless you have collapse. Collapse is the catalyst to do this. What happens when people go to the OR? 98% of them collapse their lung. And it creates that interface between healthy and bad lung. If you leave that lung down, it'll get injured, you'll get a little edema. Now, not, not everyone's going to have this propagating disaster, but some do. Maybe 30%, 20%, depending on the paper you want to read, of patients on the ventilator who don't have lung injury get lung injury. Which I think we can completely prevent. If we're just, because remember, this is silent. In fact, blood gases don't pick this up. Don't think of blood gases don't pick this up. In fact, I'm reviewing a paper, it's not a paper, it's a grant actually. Um, from the UK, it's like their version of the NIH. And actually, the, uh, the guy who's the, you know, uh, submitting the grant is a guy I've actually uh, referenced many times. And he has uh, a rapid O2 sensor. And so he can look at uh, blood, you know, PO2 changes very rapidly, under 10 milliseconds. And when he's done this, what he sees is with inspiration, the PO2 goes up and comes right back down. That's, that's the alveoli doing this, because, you know, as soon as the alveoli opens, any uh, red cell saturates its hemoglobin and then collapses, because it doesn't take long to expose the, the uh, hemoglobin to saturated fluid. So you cannot detect this with regular, taking a blood gas or your sat monitor. You need a rapid test, and when you stabilize the lung, you don't get the big fluctuations. So he's published several papers on He's got a, another technique now, uh, but... What I'm saying is that you cannot detect this clinically. You can detect it with that. Because we know that when you hit 75%, you have that video? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I'm, I'm good. I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit on that word. And um, because a lot of people believe, well, then that's too much in transit pee. And that's unsafe. So it, that, that's why I wanted you know, to know. But a couple of things with that. Remember, you know, patients always have the ability to exhale and defend their lung body. So if they, you know, if they feel that they're at TLC, they can exhale and they can defend the lung volume. Of course, if you have a patient who is paralyzed, sedated, whatever, then you have to look at, you know, the chest X-ray, look at, you know, um, if their diaphragms are still round or flat or inverted. And um, uh, but it was interesting. We looked at 200 patients um, and measured driving pressures. So if you look at your patients, your patients that come back from the OR, if they're not spontaneously breathing, you might want to start looking at driving pressures. And we, we came up with four groups, uh, standard APRV, people who are on APRV from the very beginning, uh, rescue APRV, uh, volume control ventilation, and pressure control ventilation. Out of those four groups, what do you think the highest driving pressure, what group are they in? APRV. <laughs> standard. Now, what, what do you think? Pressure, well, uh, it, it was either pressure control or uh, volume control. Hands down volume control. Pressure control. Pressure control had the highest. 
And what we can see from just, you know, looking at it is more than likely because people are still using low peeps. We had a driving pressure of 40. So the PIP was 45 and the PEEP was still at 5. So you've got a driving pressure of 40. The standard APRV had the lowest driving pressure of all groups. And that's because of the recruitment. So if you get them re-recruited, because the compliance, the driving pressure is going to go up on that patient until you re-recruit them, and then it's going to come back down. Does yeah. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the lung actually picks two things for you. Because remember, there's a pressure in here as well. So because we're not letting the lung empty, we're retaining some of the pressure. Which we're going to call that, you can call that now this DP. So the tidal line is smaller here and the peep's higher here. The peep is less here if you were to measure peep. Pressure, that's how we measure uh, driving pressure. You have to do an expiratory hold for four to five seconds and you get the, the actual pressure, the residual pressure, right? Because what I'm doing is deflating the lung, but then stopping. So there's a residual pressure. I'm not emptying the lung. So that's the pressure. And that's a static pressure. So even the term, the term auto peep is sort of poorly used. The proper way to make a distinction between the peep that's static, which is actually really versus dynamic, which is the peep that COPD years get, that creates a dynamic hyperinflation. In other words, they just keep growing. That's the peep you have to worry about. That's the real auto peep that's here. It's called dynamic hyperinflation. And you really should make that distinction. Actually, there's a paper by Marini, who he actually goes through the, uh, this in a great detail. Because people use that term very loosely. And if you want to be more precise, you talk about dynamic versus static. And what we're talking about is we need pressure. And someone who's got sick lungs, you need pressure to maintain their end expiratory lung volume, which is another way of saying FRC. That's what you guys are doing right now, by the way. It's just you don't need any pressure because your lungs are healthy. So when you guys exhale, how much air do you think is in your lung? That's called functional residual capacity. How about just a guess? What else kind of person? <laughs> <laughs> how big is your FRC? Four liters. How many liters? Four? Four liters. I think you would have to be about nine and a half feet tall. <laughs> yes. Because it's related to hot level. It's better than what it usually people say, 200 cc. So yeah. your average, you know, it does vary between uh, gender, women, parents, water, lungs, uh, height, so the taller you are, obviously, is different. But basically, basically, uh, she's late. How are you? It's Thanks for coming. I know you're like going small, Sorry. so no, it's okay. you really didn't have to. Uh, yeah, so average about two and a half to three liters. If you're super tall, three and a half. Now you can say that the Dr. Dabs is a You can stop making that up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, actually, I'm over <laughs> Yes, so, so bear in mind that what we're doing is trying to maintain the normal lung volume. Because that's really important. That is very important. It keeps your lung very stable. It just moves pressure. So that's why we're going to use the static pressure instead of a dynamic inflation. You know, your, patient, your patient can't be breathing, and you just need to do an extra torn hold for four seconds, and then go back and measure. And you would be amazed at the number of people that believe that the driving pressure is APRV is P high minus zero, because the P load set to zero. Oh, I've got so driving pressure of 27. There's no way I'm going to use that. Do an expiratory hold, yeah. then you'll see how much pressure. I it's mean, I already give you a rough number. It's about half your. So, so you've got, you know, so if your P high is 24, then your driving pressure is 12. But if you're using a short T-low, it's going to be higher. Because that's exactly what you want. Temporary. A sick lung needs more PEEP and a smaller tidal lung. A healthier lung needs less PEEP. And so you're not sort of picking up numbers out of the sky. You're matching them to the mechanics. That's the point of this. And we actually submitted um, uh, driving pressure data to ATS, so we're getting ready to present that in May. And we they accepted both of our abstracts. One was all the, the 200 patients, you know, in the groups uh, that we looked at. But the other one was a case study that we did. A patient that was referred for ECMO who could not receive ECMO because he was a Jehovah's Witness. So they put him on APRV. 
and we watched, once we finally got a setting where we wanted them, left him alone and stopped chasing, you know, um, uh, watched compliance improve, and uh, the driving pressure actually came down. So it was a really good correlate and just showed that once you get the settings appropriate, compliance improves and, you know, you didn't interfere by trying to chase and, and change things. And this is what happens with the alveoli. So you can see if you set T low inappropriately to 10% and it goes almost all the way to empty, it goes down to 10%, this is the T high, this is the T low. And you can see all these gaps, that's losing the alveoli. That's de-recruitment. And so then we tighten up the T low, it's a little bit less. Tighten it up to 50%, it's even less. And then at 75%, it's less than a 7% change between inspiratory and expiratory. You know, Pat, do you happen to have the, uh, uh, the uh, lung recovery at UCL? Yes. So I just want to show you a, a patient oh, okay. that, okay. that they was on EPRB and they took them to recover their lungs. It's Sorry, but um, just real quick, this is, these are just the videos that go along with that. So this is the one that's almost empty. So you can see, see how the de-recruitment, I mean, the, the lungs almost completely empty, it just goes real fast. Yeah. It's a little bit less. Where the determination is, is about 50%. And then at 75%, look at how stable the alveoli are. You barely move. And again, the tie wire is shrinking because that lung is sicker. It's, it's appropriate for the illness of the lung. So this is a patient, the organ donor, who uh, the transplant surgeon decided to, uh, hey, I, wanna, I, I think that's what I want to stress. If you look at the lung, or even just look at the chest wall, the chest wall doesn't move much if you set this properly. And it's usually absolutely enough for knowledge. So, What's your approach to hypercarbia? How do you do it? Yeah, so hypercarbia, it, it really comes down to a couple of key things. Because there's two mechanisms for CO2 removal that are, are really relevant. One is what we're all familiar with, which is bulk ventilation or rate, tied to vitamin rate. So that, that's relatively easy. But with APRB, because we're extending the time, you have something called diffusive ventilation, which is kind of what we do. We use diffusion. So when your airways branch and they keep branching and stuff, there's something called the terminal airway. Terminal airways are airways and it's, you're, you're starting to get to the part of the lung that actually exchanges gas. Everything else conducts gas, just transports it down to that level. The terminal airways are where gas will barely move. There's actually very little movement. And that's where molecular exchange is occurring. And it's all gradients, right? Because the, the blood coming back has a very high CO2 and a very low O2. And Hopefully, if you get out the gas down to your lung, the O2 is going to be higher in the alveolus, so it just wants to move that way. And then you can vent it back up. So you use both. That is the most efficient way to that. Conventional ventilation just does bulk. It's all done. So it moves tidal line rate. So you do have a diffusive component. The question is, when do you take out the diffusive component? And that is, you need at least two, two seconds. You're getting three seconds into five seconds. That's where ventilation gets more efficient. Because APRV uses both of those methods, you generally need less minute ventilation. So there's old data, new data, uh, showing that you need less minute ventilation to get the same CO2. So in other words, you can you have to use the ventilator less. You, you spend less money ventilating, basically. Now the problem really comes down to, you have a sick patient. A patient who does not have, has very white lungs. So I can tell you, when the lungs are white, you have to make two key distinctions. One is you have to determine, is this patient recruitable? Because diffusion needs surface area. You know, you can't have a small alveolus to create surface area. You need a big area. It's very dependent on surface area. So the problem is, what is this lung going to look like in 12, 24 hours? Because you're going to need at least 12, 24 hours. And can I tolerate 12 or 24 hours of hypercarbia? You need to make those decisions if you want to use the diffusive component right away. So if you have a patient with head injury, you might not be able to tolerate hypercarbia. So you can't Obviously, if you have a patient with end-stage pulmonary fibrosis who's on a lung transplant list, diffusion will never work. Your only option is to bulk ventilate them. Now, you also have a third option, which is to bulk ventilate the patient that you believe is recruitable. 
As long as you set that T low correctly, then that lung will start to inflate slowly. And what you'll see is the CO2 will be fine, and the CO2 gradually will come down, and that's when you start obliging the, the hypocarbia by increasing the T high. That's all you do. And it, you know, ideally, you'd want to stay at least two seconds, because that's where the bulk of recruitment occurs, at two seconds. If you go beyond that, uh, that's even better, because you get more stability. But you don't have to do that right off the bat. And yes, in an adult, you can use even one second. And as long as that T look, because we're really controlling the, we're sort of building on the previous breath, if that makes any sense. We call that the ratchet effect. We actually noticed this, believe it or not, when was that? A year or so ago? So we were in the lab. We were in the lab. And if you had asked me, uh, you know, when you were there or, you know, even a year ago, I would have told you the best way to recruit that lung is to stabilize the pressure. You know, because if we don't release the pressure, it's really straight line CPAP, right? So I would tell you that's the best way to recruit the lung. Now, Which we could solve that under a vivo microscopy 40 over 40, it, it happens. Yeah, and we, you yeah. see it recruit. It does happen. But it does happen, but you know, what happens, well, so just to give you an idea, when we do an experiment with these pigs, we we always inflate the lungs after we remove them from the, from the body, the thorax, at 25 centimeters. Why do we pick 25? Because 25 gives you total lung capacity in a normal, healthy lung. And so in order to standardize the histology, because when we look at the histology, we want to eliminate collapse so we don't call it you know, diffuse alveolar damage. And what I mean by that is if, if you have, here's, here's two alveolar walls. And if they do this, it looks like alveolar septal thickening. And that wouldn't be fair because it's really just collapse. So we want to standardize the histology. So all groups get 25. So we treat them all the same. So when we slice their lung and look at it under the microscope, we can say, look, we've standardized the histology. It would be unfair if you included one over here and one over there. That's why we do it. Normally, we do that on CPAP. So we 25 a CPAP, and we let the lung slowly inflate, because you know you have to deflate it, as you know, you know, <laughs> when we're closely <laughs> through the sternum, and you know, we don't want to hurt the lung when we're doing that. And it's hard to get it out when it's fully inflated. So we have to let the lung sort of deflate, but we want to reinflate it to that 25 centimeters. So we made a mistake, and we left the lung on EPRB. And that lung just went doo, 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 doo. So adding a release made that lung recruit faster. Now again, I would have told you that's kind of crazy. And believe me, I am learning so much. I mean, I thought I knew a lot about EPRB. I don't actually. I'm learning a lot more. But that lung recruit, so then we did it again. Same thing happened. So that somehow that T low does something uh, bizarre. Now, what does it actually do? I don't know, but we just got a big grant. So we got a big million dollar plus grant. What is it? Two million actually. So we're working with a guy named Don Gaver to Ling, a guy named Jason Bates in Vermont. And they have some ideas, we have some ideas too. But the thought is that it, uh, because what, what, what Don Gaver and, and Tulane have studied for years, is he's noticed that when you, and he grows like alveolar cells and tubes and all this stuff, so he's got a lot of sort of very dish research, basically. And what he notices is any time the gas flow goes like that, it spreads the, surfac the surfactant over like a nice film, which is what you need to stabilize the lung. So he thinks it's all because of this movement. Because if you watch, APRV releases, and then it goes back up again. And he thinks that movement is really important. And he has published papers on it. And so that's why he's involved in this grant, because he believes that this is the... Now, I can't tell you that's the actual mechanism. But what I can tell you is, if you hold CPAP continuously, it does not recruit. It does recruit, but not nearly as well as if you add that little release. And as long as you set that release 75%, it fixes something, and I don't know what. Because we take them even, you know, on CPAP, and they're well recruited, and then when you add APRV, they grow even more. And that's those alveoli that are hidden between the walls. So yeah. they're there, but they're, you know, they're, they're still hidden. Let, let me just also describe, if you've recruited as much as you can recruit, and you're still hypercarbon. Your approach is to drop the T high. You yes. need to, yes. Right? yes. Yes, yeah, go down to what I'm saying. Go to T high. Go down to here, folks. 
You just remember the five second thing is really for a more more normal lung, right? Yeah. Because you know when we when we first started looking at the post operative patients, if you do three seconds or four, you go ahead and do three seconds four on your post operative patient. Watch what happens. Your PCO two is going to be twenty eight, and your pH is going to be seven five. And so we eventually went out to that range just because we saw a lot of hypocarbia. But I think to clarify, so a couple of things. Um, is that if your patient is not spontaneously breathing and you can keep stretching them out and stretch them out, about seven seconds is the max that you will ever get. And then you will equilibrate and your CO2 will go up. You can't get beyond seven seconds. But it, like you said, if they're well recruited, if they're completely recruited. I think one, of, now does this answer the questions, the, the slide? So the first thing is your diffusion um, potential. So if you have a completely whited out chest x-ray, you have to question, well, they have no surface area. So of course you can't exchange gas. I might need to increase my P-high to get alveoli open in order to exchange gas. The um, second one, increase the T-high. Actually, if they're doing well, they're spontaneously breathing. You saw that. You actually increase the T-high, it drops the rate, and the CO2 goes down. You know, how does that happen? It increases its surface area, mean airway pressure. Now, the third one, to decrease the T-high, you would be amazed, even at our trauma center, how many people, they go to switch over to a and for whatever reason, they have locked in their head that the T-high has to be at 5. You just came from a rate of 28. Why would you choose a T-high of 5, which gives you a rate of 10, right? You just came from a rate of 28. It's not, you know, magic. It, you know, you're going to need a T-high of about 3 seconds. And so you, you might have to reduce it until you can get alveoli recruited and until you can get that to happen. Now, the, uh, the last one is uh, this, and I put that in there because we did have a case where someone said, oh, okay, well, I'm having problems with my CO2. I'm going to go up on my P-high. So why would you go up on your P-high when your T-low is set too tight? See how, you know, that, that needs to be out there. So it was set at 0.5, set it at 0.6, everything was right. So just make sure your T-low is, is set not too tight because here the um, uh, um, the evil of good is better, right? Just because 75% is good doesn't mean that 85% is better. If they're not spontaneously breathing, then that's too tight. So I just want to pull out one thing you said, until they recruit. Yes. Right? So you just don't set it, and that's it. Correct. Right? You got set it. They yeah, recruit also when you get a blood test. They want to adjust it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So remember, I mean, you always have a rate. The only thing is we're just changing the configuration, right? Conventional ventilation is one second inspiratory time, five seconds at the peak level. Here we're just flipping around, 5.5 and 0.5. That's still six seconds, which is the rate of 10. Cycle time six seconds. And you still get a tidal box. So you can ventilate them just as, as much. So uh, that's important. Now, I do want to just, I just want to come back to this other theory that Don Gaber had. So in the literature, there seems to be some another component here. And I'll just draw it out. It looks like this. But there's these things called liquid bridges. And they're just like little, I don't know what, I don't know what you call it, just edema. And it's stuck in the tubes, in the very small tubes. And he thinks that when you actually create this flow that goes very rapidly here, you're going to bust that up and then actually get air into this part of the lung because of the rapid flow in and out. Now, again, the grant hopefully will help us understand that so we have a bunch of experiments. But I wouldn't have, I mean, it, I'm still amazed by it, to be honest with you. I would have never thought that adding a release would be important, but it seems to be. Okay. Oh, case scenarios? Yeah. Oh, sorry. If we got a couple of case scenario questions, just whenever you have done it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, you, want, you guys are going to present some cases? No, I think they had some. Oh, I, I, I okay. haven't seen them, but I know they put some together. Yes. Oh. Okay, great. Yeah. And by the way, I, you know, we're, we're going to keep talking, so if you, if you can tell us what we can add. <laughs> I mean, I hope people are being taken care of in the hospital somewhere, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Does anybody have any questions? No, you guys have a lot of questions. It's okay, there's no bad questions right now.
Once you initiate um, APRV or TCAB, what is the best time to get a blood gas to make some setting changes? Well, honestly, it depends on how sick the patient is. So if you're going to transition a very sick patient like a rescue, I would tell you to get a blood gas in 30 minutes. Now, <coughs> not for the PO2. And I would just tell you, the PO2 is going to take a while. You just want to make sure you're happy with them. And that would be more bulk ventilation, so a shorter TI. So rescue patients do require that. Uh, so you need more of that bulk ventilation. Otherwise, I would just tell you, especially if the patient's breathing, when the patient's breathing, there's all kinds of information about what their brain is telling their muscles to do. Remember that you, know, you can't fake breathing. Like you guys aren't even thinking about breathing, are you? So our brainstem does all that. And our brainstem controls breathing by telling our respiratory muscles what to do. They don't do anything on their own. They're, they're thoughtless. The brainstem is constantly getting information back because it's planning the next breath. And what does it want to do? What, is, what does the brainstem want to do? It has a bunch of respiratory centers that are designed to make sure you ventilate properly. What I mean by that is you never want to overventilate more than is necessary. Like right now, you guys are breathing at a Know, relatively low normal level because your metabolic activity isn't as high as you're going to run up to a code. Right? And your brain understands that your respiratory muscles use oxygen and they make carbon dioxide. Remember, their job is to bring in oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. So your brain doesn't want you to use up more oxygen or make more carbon dioxide because its job is to sort of, it always wants to do it efficiently. But it also understands that it has to dynamically change. Again, if you're going to go running somewhere, it's not going to work if you stay at your current level. So that feedback is tremendous. And it looks at chemical things. You know the chemical things, right? PCO2, pH, PO2. And your brain will say, you need to breathe more because you're hypoxic. Or your PCO2 is high. I'm sorry, your pH is low. Like if you have perfectly normal lungs and I infuse you with acid, I promise you, you're going to ventilate more because your pH is going to drop and your brain is going to say, you need to get that pH up. So you're going to do that. So it's got all that. But it also has mechanical sensors. And the mechanical sensors are all over the place. They're between your airways. You know? Every little carina in your airway has a little stretch receptor. And it's coiled up. And when you take a breath, your carina does this. So it says, oh, I'm stretched this far or I'm stretched this far. And then it relates how much effort you made to get that stretch. right? If I make a big effort, my lung, my brain expects my, that stretch receptor to go like this. But if it only moves this much with a lot of effort, the brain goes, oh, there's something wrong. Those lungs are pretty stiff. I better tell the respiratory muscles to need more energy. It can, it can tell how far your ribs are. You know, a little information about how far your ribs are, how much tension there is on the diaphragm. It's just a very elaborate system to allow us to breathe through a whole spectrum. Actually, human breathing is far more elegant than a mechanical model. So It's so crude to ventilate people with this order. Okay, can we just want to put a scenario for your eyes? So you walk into a room, you see a patient in trouble. What's the first thing you look at? Well, I will look at the flow pattern, and, a, and, and I will glance at what muscles the patient's capable of breathing. Because what I was trying to say is that there's all kinds of information if you learn how to read the brain stem. Right? Because the brain stem knows if you if if you can't exhale and your lungs are too big, it's going to tell you to squeeze the air out. So you're going to use your accessory expiratory muscles versus your inspiratory muscles. So right there, you've got a clue. Instead of sort of guessing, let's try to deconstruct, dissect through what is the brain telling the muscles to do. So if you learn how to read that, you can figure out a lot of things. So yes, look at your patient, look at the waveforms, look at the patient. I mean, that's what I do. I go like this. And then I might feel their abdomen, see if they're actively exhaling and so on. Then I try to figure it out. Like if they're obstructed, I'm going to say, does this patient have COPD or asthma? I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I'm on call and I don't know the patient. And they say, no, he doesn't. So then I'm going to say, well, is a circuit, oh, the circuit is kinked in the bed frame. I've seen that before. Yeah, have you ever seen a chest tube? That happens. You know, so things like that happen. Or the endotracheal tube was like this. Or, you know, the patient does have rocket spasm, or there's something wrong with the ventilator. So, again, it would sort of help you understand what they're doing. Um, when they're really chaotically breathing, yeah, it's a little bit harder to interpret waveforms. So you really 
need to look at their what muscles they're using. Is it an inspiratory? Because if your brain, if the receptors come back that your lung is small and, and, and stiff, the brain is going to say muscles, you know, do more, and, and you're going to use a lot of inspiratory muscles. Because remember, the brain stem has never been told there is such a thing as a ventilator. It has no idea there's ECMO. It doesn't know it. The only thing it's trying to do is keep you alive. And so it will use everything and anything to keep you alive. It doesn't know you're on a ventilator. So it's going to react to the information it's getting back. And, you know, I can't tell you that you can figure out every little detail, but I can figure out a lot. But just understanding a few little things about how inflation, deflation works and what muscles you use to, to breathe in it. That's really it. I mean, the chemical stuff overlaps the mechanical. So this, this is where it gets a little bit trickier. What I mean by that is that there's a hierarchy. So let's say your lungs are a little bit stiff, but you're oxygenating okay, so your brain is sort of telling you to, to breathe a certain way, but then all of a sudden you get severely hypoxic. Now that's going to trump everything else. So you may have a drive to breathe, even if your mechanics have gotten better, just because of the hypoxia. So there's sort of this, which one is going to kill me first kind of thing, and it it reprioritizes. So when you have that, it's harder to isolate the mechanical interpretation. In other words, if your pH is okay, your PCO2 is okay, your PO2 is okay, and your patient's distressed because they can be, it's a mechanical problem related to inhalation and exhalation. The chemical stuff's a little bit easier to figure out, so that's why if you exclude that, you can focus on the mechanical. That's okay. Um, so I'm used to saying people are a bit setting a system for right? a bit setting the kind of what would be the thing here that is wrong with that people setting kind of goes to the one on the CDC. Well, I would say most people that don't use APRD routinely would probably select this as a rescue mode. And certainly that's how we initially started using it. And there's more information on people using it as a rescue mode. And there's papers published from places like Australia showing that, you know, you can save people from going on to ECMO. Uh, you know, so, so I would say the bulk of people use it as a rescue mode. Over time, people start to use it, I think, earlier and earlier. And that, that's exactly what happened to us. We just said, you know, well, if it's safer from ECMO, why don't we just use it a little bit earlier? So we just kept doing it. Now we use it routinely as soon as you're intubated. And some of the research we've done suggests that you can prevent the problems that you can get into the ARDS and, and lung disease. Uh, because a lot of it, almost 70% of ARDS is in hospital. And the peak time is 30 hours after admission. 30 hours, 36 hours. Now there's obviously people that get sick with flu or something like that. They come in sick. But a good number of these patients develop this while they're on the ventilator within sort of, sort of the first 30 plus hours of being in the hospital. That would suggest that A, we might have an opportunity to change something, and B, maybe we're doing something to sort of help things along, or we're not paying attention enough. And like I said, if the, the latest literature is suggesting that when you just have some collapsed areas in the lung, totally silent, you're not going to pick it up with a blood gas, it starts to damage little parts of the lung. But then it creates a new area of damage. And hopefully your patient gets better or extubated before that happens. But if it's allowed to sort of propagate enough, you may lose enough lung where the patient gets sick enough. And then we're forced to do sort of rescue stuff. I don't like rescue stuff anymore. I'm just probably too old for rescue stuff. But you don't want your patient in a rescue situation either. So I think it's perfectly fine to use it as a rescue strategy. But I would just tell you what I've evolved to is using it to prevent. Because I'm tired of the rest of it, all that stuff. So what about those patients that people feel like that have continuous airway? Are they have a blood reception? Or part of the lung is, you know, artificially removed, or the staple yeah. line that hasn't healed, or the, the theory of barrel time, like what would you say? Yeah, so, you know, obviously, you know, so we've done this a lot, in fact, uh, uh, actually, I, I got a patient in the unit who was 
he was really sick. I hadn't seen him in years, but he was a sick patient from years ago. It's like, oh, I didn't know this guy was here. I don't even know if he was there when you guys were there. It's possible. Um, but he had bilateral low lobectomies. Bilateral. And then he got really sick and both broke down. And he had a 60 liter leak. And he was on ECMO. And uh, I was away out of the country. And I came back. The guy had a PO2 with 6 liters, 6.5 liters of blood flow of 20, high 20s, low 30s, and cardiac arrest. And what they had done was they took him off the ventilator completely to stop the air leaks. The air leaks don't stop. And what actually worsens the air leaks is if you make the lung less compliant. And I, I think that's just an important concept. So you do want to use the lowest pressure. You don't want to do too much to the lung. Let me see if I can you know, try to draw this concept a little bit. Let's just do a, uh, let's do a right um, pneumonectomy, okay? Let's just do a pneumonectomy. This is the left side over here, right side, okay? So here's the suture line. And then you got this lung over here. Okay, now remember the tubes are not meant to expand. They just conduct. They don't sort of absorb energy like the lung does. Where the energy is absorbed in that, in that spongy part of the lung. So whatever pressure you're putting in the airway here, it's going to go here. Now someone comes along and says, oh, we have to use the lowest pressure possible. So you turn the pressure down. Now this part of the lung collapses. And this part of the lung collapses. You're actually increasing the pressure in the tubes. You're actually doing something that would harm that. The best thing to do is keep the lung recruited and use the lowest pressure to keep the lung recruited. Anytime you let that lung collapse, the pressure goes right there. Now, let's just draw a fistula. Here's a fistula. Here's a BP fistula. Okay. Now, the fistula, unlike the rest of the lung, has infinite compliance. Right? Just like this room, right? If I blow air in this, it's just going to keep blowing in this room. It's not going to be contained in something. And there's no resistance. So this is the easiest part to push gas through here. And so when you inflate this part of the lung, it will absorb some of that, and hopefully there's enough lung to squeeze this down, choke it. But if you start collapsing the lung and making it stiffer, as the compliance here worsens, the flow through the fistula is going to go up. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yes, pressure is a component, but it's not the only component, and it would be, you need to think about the whole thing. So I would just, and the worst thing you can do is go from collapse to reinflation. You know, if this lung was collapsed and I wanted to, and you guys called me and said, well, what do we do? The patient's dying now. And now the patient's not exchanging any gas. But we have the stump to deal with, so what do we do? Let him die, but the stump's okay? I don't know. Somebody's going to say, well, we need to save this patient. So now what I do is I start recruiting this thing. I'm not going to recruit this first. I'm going to put a lot of pressure here first. You don't want to be in that situation. This is where you will blow out of stuff. In that situation. So you just have to be more thoughtful about it. And, not, and get the patient breathing, to be honest with you. That is by far, that mitigates the ventilator. Because I'm not trying to say the ventilator is useful here. I'm not advocating for more pressure or you know even EPRB. I'm not advocating for any of that. What I'm saying is you need to keep the lung healthy. Whatever way you can keep that lung normally inflated. And I would tell you to start looking at, at the, the x-ray. You know, we don't look at x-rays well enough. I'll just tell you that if you want someone to have normal lung volume, these are clavicles here, and uh, I'm going to just draw these. These are the diaphragms. Now, the curve of the diaphragm tells you about lung volume. You want a nice curve of the diaphragm to be mid clavicular once you start hyperinflating that patient, so if you have a stump and you, you, can, you want to know, well, how do I use the lowest pressure that keeps the lung healthy? This is the lung volume. So when the, when the lung starts to hyperinflate, it gets flat here, and then the curve moves lateral. So it actually moves away from that. And that correlates with, with FRC, which is where you are, which is where everyone is. That's the best lung volume. The heart works best, the lungs work best, that's the right lung volume. Not too low, not too high. So you can use the radiograph to help tease that out. If you start seeing this, then you're going to reduce the pressure. If you start seeing the opposite, you know, because the, the diaphragm has a lumbar insertion, 
and it comes out like this, it fans out. This is where you get, um, when you start collapsing the lung, that curve moves right here, moves medial. And as you hyperplate, it moves out where you go to the We actually wrote a paper, it was a nursing paper, but it talks about exactly what Dr. Bosch was talking about here about mechanical ventilation and that, you know, you're, you're challenged to, um, you know, the stump, but atelectasis requires more airway pressure, and cause, usually is what causes the stump to blow out. Yep. Yeah, but but you do you don't want to just. And use, I said that to you. You don't want to use pressure, oh, yeah. and yes. you don't want to use pressure and a lot of time and all that stuff. You, you want to you want to be careful, uh, but don't just turn everything down and use the lowest. I mean, you read a textbook; they'll tell you turn the peak down. And I mean, I'm, I promise you, you're going to hurt the. Yeah, we, we actually worked briefly with a neonatologist in uh, Mississippi, and um, he started putting all of his babies with BP fistulas on a gear beat. And uh, it had, had more success, he said, than with high frequency, because he used to put them on high frequency. But now they can breathe, you know, they could uh, interact, and, and uh, he, he said that they seemed to do much better. Actually, they just published a recent meta-analysis, which I'm not a big fan of, but nonetheless, it's a meta-analysis, looking at a lot of EPRB studies. Not all of them are, are perfect, but uh, the tendency, what they concluded, was lower, less ventilator days, uh, better outcome, less barotrauma, and no effect on the dynamics. And that's a paper that was just published. Do you have Okay, we'll, we'll send it to you. Yeah, you saw it. It just it just came out. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, this is great. I, now we've got questions. Well, but I think now what? We have to leave. No, well, no, no, no. We have. Um, I think they've published some scenarios, and I think we'd like to go over it and to help both the, the respiratory therapists, the nurses, understanding how to drop and stretch and move through the spectrum. And so maybe if we go there, more questions will pop up as we kind of go okay, through sure. the scenarios Absolutely. about like what would be appropriate, how can we change, you know, all that stuff. Could you have and I'll just get you to say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. <laughs> it's on our paper. It's on the paper. Oh, it is on the paper. Oh, 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 but I mean, do you have it on a jump drive or anything? No, 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 no. Oh, I don't think they do. Yes. Um, the, 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 the reasoning behind the P high being setting up the, the pressure. P low zero? The pressure support. Um, I mean, not pressure support, the... Oh my God! I'm looking at the zero number. The one with the zero. The pizza. No, 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 no. Uh, so no, it's too low, and then we set it above two. What is this? Pressure, pressure support. That's well, it's two, 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 yeah, yeah, so high. Depending on the yeah, yeah. The on the eight forty. What is the concept? The why is it two? It, why is it just set two above? Like I don't. That's the whole okay. thing. It's not two above. So, are you, so do you mean you're setting pressure support to two? Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, so yeah. she pressure support. You're asking what's the difference? Above the P-high. Oh, you're talking about the flow and, and the circuit pressure being a little, a little bit higher than the P-high. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The confusion is that you have the 840s here and a servo. And in the 840s, we put it above P. So if this, let's say P is 30, we put it at 32. Now, when we go on the servo, if the servo's P-high P is 30, we just put pressure support above P, above 2. I think that's what she's doing. Yeah, so. Yeah, I, I mean, so unfortunately, both those ventilators don't really do APRB. I'm not saying you can't use them. You know, and let me, let me just try to explain the fundamental difference. So, APRB is what we call time cycle CPAP. It's a very, very simple dumb load. What I mean is it holds pressure, and then it says hold the pressure for how long? And then you tell it how long, and then you say drop the pressure, drop it to whatever you want. And then it says, how long should I drop the pressure? And then it just does it. It's then. It doesn't care about what the patient does. There's actually no trigger in real APR. There's no trigger because the patient adjusts breathing by changing the volume and flow, right? If they go like this, they get more flow. Because what happens is the pressure will go down and the machine wants to raise the pressure back to that, whatever CPAP level you set. And that's really that's really APRV. All these other modes really came out after APR, because APRV was a hot number, right? So the Draeger had in 1987. Nobody else had it. They just, uh, they just put it in there for whatever reason. They put it in there. Um, so we started using it. 
And what happened was, in the like mid 90s, pure bad culture. And they want to know, we want to put APRV in our network. So we actually had a lot of discussion about what they should do. So they didn't want to get rid of the rate knob, so that's why you have to go in the sub menu. They did not think that the respiratory therapists and physicians would feel comfortable in not having a T low and a T high, which is a rate knob, separated. They wanted it. And what they did was they modified pressure, SIV pressure control. So what you're really using when you say by vent or by level in both of those modes is SIV pressure control. That's what the real mode is. The only thing they did was change the software so that you can tweak the time and so on. That's what they did. So what does that mean? That means there, it has pressure support, has a trigger. It has a trigger, and this is what makes it a little more unstable to use both of these ventilators. Again, I'm not saying that you can't use it unless you use the trigger. I'm just saying there's a little, a few little quirks about it. And part of the reason is that anytime you have pressure support, you have something called a trigger window. Right? You have a lot of respiratory therapists shaking their heads. Which basically said, the ventilator wants to know, well, should I give you a breath now? You know, so as you approach uh, the breath, it might say, well, if he's going to breathe right here, I might as well just give him the breath now. Actually, that's what SIV is. Originally, IMV, for your time, was not synchronized. So it just it just did this. It was time to ignore EPRV, except EPRV flipped over. IMD, that's what he cares for you. So th there's that trigger. So pressure support requires a trigger also. Pressure support's a triggered mode. So there's a trigger window before and after. Because, you know, if you just took an inhalation, the machine doesn't want to cycle off another breath. So there's a trigger window on both sides of that breath. So this is what inherently makes it a little bit funny. So on the servo, you've always got pressure support because that ventilator was very difficult to trigger. By the way, the servo Yes. Yeah. So the servo I servo it doesn't matter. That's the servo 300 inside. You ever make that inside? It's the servo 300, which is a ventilator for the 80s. And what happens is that ventilator, that ventilator was so difficult to trigger that the way they fixed it was they had to put a bias flow in. So there's a bias flow of four to six centimeters. And that's why that's a very jumpy ventilator. There's always pressure support. Suction, do anything, that ventilator just goes absolutely crazy. Because that's the bias flow. That, they did that to help trigger that Because the 300 was very difficult. And of course, they changed the expiratory side. So that's a brand new expiratory side, a block. But the inspiratory side is, is still a server 300. And the way they fixed the trigger on that. So what that means is, in my opinion, there should be no pressure support in the So if you guys said it, that's fine. But just remember, that as you inflate your lungs, let's just say you put someone on a PHI of 20, but 20 was enough to overinflate their lungs, okay? They cannot take any more air, just like if you take your lungs all the way up to total lung capacity. I, I can't, my diaphragms are flat. I cannot generate any volume. I can't even generate a lot of pressure. Nothing happens. But if I generate enough pressure to trigger the ventilator, you've got me set to tender pressure support, and I'm all the way up here, you're going to inflate me more. So if we have a built-in safety factor, which is you can't breathe more than total lung capacity. You, know, you can't over-breathe, if that makes any sense. Even your COPD are stuck. They can't keep getting their, making their lungs bigger. They must not be able to shrink their lungs, they can't make it bigger. Fresh support, you're going to force more air into the lung. So I would just tell you, I don't think it's safe, personally. And not only that, it screws up their breath. Makes it a machine breath. We didn't even talk about that. But pressure support is really, it's really a worthless move. Yeah, I should have said from bi-level and put it in place the APRP button. Yes. So what ATC, I have no idea what the trigger, doesn't that actually add support with the ATC converted servo that doesn't cover the front level or A40 that doesn't have ATC? Well, have you have you used ATC? No. On the trigger? No, but... Isn't that the same as a support? But well, you know, so let me just tell you, just because you have some things that are the same, doesn't make it the same. So yeah. like a Maserati has wheels and a steering wheel, <laughs> not the same thing as a Volkswagen. Like Honda, Honda. Or Honda, whatever you <laughs> <laughs> So there's some similarities, right, so there's pressure, absolutely. But here's the, here's the key thing about spontaneous breathing. So I'll just talk, I'll shift gears to talk about spontaneous breathing. So the whole idea is spontaneous, and we actually have a lot more information than we've ever had 
even though when these guys were fellows, I was still whining daily. I'm sure they remember. Why isn't this patient breathing? Let this patient breathe. Why did I say that back then? Is because we know now that the diaphragm, every day you don't let the patient breathe, thins. It thins, and by four days you can predict who's going to be a long one versus a short one. There's some new data that just finally came out now. This is called ventilator-induced lung, ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction. And now people are using the term ventilator protect, diaphragm protective ventilation. So you can hear that. Um, and this has been studied for years. So I've been reading this literature for years. And finally, and the human data has come together nicely in the last probably two years. It also shows that if your diaphragm thickens, you take just as long to read. And so, so think about it this way, because sometimes breathing is a little too abstract. You don't want a, uh, a hemoglobin of one, right? But we don't want a hemoglobin of eight, because then, then you've got the lower <coughs> of your veins. What we want is something normal. So same thing with, with the lung. When you're breathing, you know, you need to use enough, um, to use your muscles enough so that you don't decondition them. And what you don't want to do is overwork them so you don't hypertrophy them. Because as you, if you remember, I said the respiratory muscles are incredibly efficient. And once you make muscles too big, they outgrow their blood supply. You know, like, like it's not very efficient. So like if you take someone who's very fit, uh, and you take a big bodybuilder and you ask them to climb up a uh, like stair, I don't, there's actually a YouTube video, I don't know if you've seen it or not. Big strong guy, he starts climbing, goes up there quickly, he's got a lot of power, and this uh, petite woman who's, you know, fit, goes right past him. Because he's he's hanging up there like this. You know, his, his, he's got so much lactic acid in his uh, arms that he just can't go up anymore. So your, your respiratory muscles are designed to be efficient, and not only are they... Um, able to do like burst or something like coffee and stuff, but they're actually made for endurance. So what we want to do is maintain the diaphragm. The diaphragm thins faster than skeletal muscle. And that thins very, thins very rapidly. So the question is, how do you preserve that? And the best way to preserve that is spontaneous breathing. Now we get into, well, is pressure support spontaneous breathing? What do you guys think? I would disagree with you. I would say it's pressure support spontaneous and trigger doesn't allow your muscles to do what they want to do. And actually, studies have shown that you can't set pressure support correctly. You either over or under. You're either going to get a thin diaphragm or a thick diaphragm. So here's what's important. So remember, uh, and I'll just use an analogy, okay? I'm a super strong guy, chocolate. So I bench press easily 500 pounds. I don't. But let's just say I'm going to bench press 500 pounds, right? So let me just show you the analogy of pressure support. Pressure support, I can go like this, just click my wrist like this, and behind the curtain, there's these two really super strong guys, and they go like this. The only thing I have to do is ride the, the way up. That's pressure support. This pressure support is just saying, when is that patient going to take a breath? Oh, he just did. Get out of the way, patient. Let me do what I want to do. That's pressure support. That's now, ATC, that's pressure. Yeah, see so you get that, that decelerating flow. So if that's the patient wants breath. 20 centimeters, it's set at 10. If they want 5, it's set at 10. If they want 15, it's at 10. So they're getting 10 no matter what the effort is. So pressure support cannot actually, there's now data. There's a lot of old data, but now coupling it with the fact that it's not friendly to your diaphragm. You either have a patient that's not on enough pressure support and they're working hard, or you have a patient that's over supported and they just trigger the memory. So you're going to get a thin diaphragm or a thick diaphragm. You're never going to get the just right. The only way to get the just right is to make it a human breath. Now, what is a human breath? It's sinusoidal. That's a human breath. That's a human breath. In other words, you guys control the flow, this is flow, time course of your breath. Take a breath. You control that, right? If you are pressure for a trigger, the flow is the machine. So in essence, what causes a spontaneous breath, which is superior to any machine breath, including the machine breath of APRV, it distributes the ventilation to this back of your lungs instead of front of your lungs. Our lungs are much bigger back there. Right? Guys, you know, the lower lungs are huge. This is the difference in distribution of ventilation from real spontaneous breathing. So what you want is proportionality. So 
heading the patient has to control the flow type course of the breath, right? And B, it's got to be proportional. What do I mean by that? Watch this, watch this. It was proportionate to my effort. So your patient has the luxury to do whatever, as long as you don't encumber them with all these triggers and all this other stuff that makes the machine do stuff. You have to let that patient use their muscles and complete the, ex the, the breathing. You can't interrupt the breathing. So breathing has to continue. If you stop breathing, what happens? If I go, let's say I wanted to do a breath that looked like this, like that, okay? But what happens if I suddenly say, I stopped? What, what, what happens? I don't get anything more. With pressure cord, you're still giving me my breath. So in other words, my muscles don't have to make the full, they don't have to do the work. They don't have to do the full contraction. It could just be a trigger. So pressure support would be like me standing up here this whole day with my mouth open, but nothing comes out. I want to talk to you guys, but I'm just going to do that. Right? The trigger is just that it's not the full breath. It's not the full communication I'm going to give you to talk to you. I have to complete that. In other words, the patient can't get off the hook. The patient's got to do the work. And then the key is to make sure the work breathing is not excessive. <clears throat> There's no way around that. You have to let the patient breathe. And just I just want to say one last thing very quickly. Just understand what your diaphragm is all about. Your diaphragm is contracting in utero. So you weren't even born and your diaphragm is contracting. And normal respiratory rate is about uh, 12 it's really 8 to 12. Any less than 8 slow. Any above 12, you start getting high. It's not 20. Normal rate's more like 12. <coughs> so 12 times a minute. Can you do the math for me? It's a big number. No, 12 times 60. 12 times a minute. How many minutes in a day? 720. No, there's 1,540 minutes in a oh, day. Oh, no. Well, okay, so 720 times 24 is 17,000. Okay, so that's 17,000, what's it called, 17,000 contractions. Well, let's say you guys are all going to live to a nice ripe age of 100 plus. It's a lot of contractions. And that thing has never stopped. Remember, that thing doesn't stop because you have bed tonight. Your diaphragm still contracts. In other words, it, it's made to continue to contract. It doesn't understand, stop me from eating. You know, just like the heart. Those two muscles don't stop until you die. Now, obviously we can save you by doing a bunch of stuff, but, but the way the body was made was those muscles were built with the intention of beating until you die, or contracting until you die, your heart or your diaphragm. Because without the diaphragm, you will die. If your diaphragm does not contract, you will die. So just understand, it's not made to be paused. And this happens within 24 hours of controlled ventilation, even APRV controlled ventilation. So that's why I would say that you know you really want the patient to have a nice sinusoidal breath, and you want their work of breathing to be just right, not too much, not too little. Do you want to talk about preferential Well, I know that we probably need to get to those those cases. So any last question? Just to follow up with that. Yeah. So, uh, so by adding force to force, we're you're you're making that a machine breath. Yes. So that means by adding support, we should not add support, we should add support because we're actually depriving the patient from volume. Because he's asking for more. Yeah, but you know, why is so, the patient asking for more? It could be that your PI is not set right. Correct. That's you know, what so it's like a mechanical thing, thing or a chemical thing. Depriving them of volume. But you need to actually increase the volume pressure, not the support. Yeah, so we're just exactly trying right. to make exactly it right. look better. Yeah, but you well, actually. You know, more. But you know, you have the PPs, and I don't know if you have, you have uh, yeah. So if you if you want, I use proportional. Okay, I'll ask about that. So I use that because there's only three modes that you can use that don't screw up the patient's breath. Correct. And the way you can easily tell is that they're sinusoidal. Now, actually, I didn't answer your question about automatic tube composition. Automatic tube composition uses pressure, yes. but it is proportionate to the effort. So it's measuring flow every five milliseconds, and it says this is the flow, this is the pressure drop, and it uses pressure in proportion, <coughs> breath to breath. That's why if you look at ATC, the breath remains sinusoidal. It does not become a decelerate flow like pressure support. Now, tube composition on the pure bed, it doesn't work that way. It yeah. works as a support. 
as pressure supply. Yeah. Yes. So real to compensation is proportional to the flow, which flow is effort, right? That's more effort than that. So that's how it works. Now PAV amplifies that, right? PAV is an amplifier. So you will so I use PAV and I'm telling you if you need more, use PAV if you want if you want to. I mean I think APRV is better for recruitment, but PAV at least lets the you know what? So PAV is like a microphone, an amplified microphone, right? It's still, so back to uh, bench pressing here. So I can't do the 500, but instead of those big strong guys doing all the work, I'm going to have to do the work, but you're going to make me work, but you're going to share a portion of that work by, you know, giving me a little bit of support. So I still have to push up, and now it's going to feel like I'm bench pressing what I can bench press, which is 10 pounds. <laughs> You know, it's going to feel like I can bench press something a little bit easier. So it's still my voice with PAV, and I'm speaking into a microphone because my voice is too weak, but now you guys want to hear me. So it's going to amplify that. It's going to amplify that, and if I stop talking, it stops amplifying. So the patient is forced to continue their breath. So that is, is a human breath, or close to human breath. Uh, CPAP is a human breath. The breathing in APRV, which is CPAP, is a human breath. And they all are proportional, and the patient controls their flow. And those are the ones that make your lungs healthier. Uh, Penny just finished a study with something called EIT. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Anyways, it's like a, a belt you put on your chest, on your patient's chest. And it's like a little uh, CAT scan, except it uses electrical current. And it spins around at 60 times a second. And what we get is a, a injection of current. And as it goes through the chest, you know, Electricity has a harder time going through air and tissue. So it slows down when it goes through air. So we can actually see you breathe. So this thing has very good what we call temporal resolution. Temporals like changes. Uh, CAT scans have good spatial resolution. You know, the heart's here, the aorta's here, the lungs here. You, you have the anatomy, but you don't see things moving, right? It's like taking a picture versus watching a video. So this gives us information. So Penny's done some. Uh, you presented this, right? Yeah, do you have it to show? Or? Oh, okay, we can't show it. Anyway, what she did was she compared pressure support, <coughs> CPAP, and PAP, and where the distribution of ventilation, because there's a lot of studies, CAT scan studies, and some very fancy studies that show when you use pressure support, what you're doing is ventilating here. You actually stop ventilating the bases, because the air goes in faster than the patient can pull it in. So it just pushes the anterior. And you guys should see this. If you switch on the CPAP, you'll see their belly move, not their chest move. Go on pressure support, you'll see their chest move, not their belly. Because their diaphragm's actually not working. Anytime the diaphragm's working, you see the belly stick out. When the diaphragm's contract, you see the belly stick out. So do it yourself. You see for yourself. So what happens is the air is stays here in pressure support. On PAV, it goes deeper into the bases, and the deepest is CPAP. Which is where we ventilate. We don't ventilate as much here. We ventilate back here because your your lower lobes are much bigger than the, the non-dependent lobes. Much bigger. That's where all the stuff happens. And this is the part of the lung that gets the most uh, abuse when you're laying flat on your back, and sedating people, and doing all this. Stuff. So you want people to ventilate. Back. Did that answer? Any other questions? I think we're going to do the case. Chaka, I don't know what kind of time. I mean, I don't want to hold everyone up here. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Let's go through a case. You guys ready for this? So we'll just read put the case together. I looked at it. I don't. You're gonna have to walk us through with how how it how it's formulated. Because it looks like there's some ABGs. And what are we looking for in this case? I think what they're looking for, Dr. Shepherd, is this actually a patient here looking for. And wanted to know if the adjustment of the settings that what we have in this patient can we do any better based on um, settings and results? Well, I read I read through the whole thing, and uh, the the only question that I have that um, I found interesting because it looked like towards the middle got recruited, started looking better, but then all of a sudden. You went down to a rate of 11, everything looked good and uh, looked perfect, and then all of a sudden you started getting a respiratory acidosis, and the respiratory acidosis worsened, and then it, imp 
improved a bit when um, uh, it looks like the P high was increased. But I don't know, do you measure your T low at 75%? Well, first of all, do you, you lock the T low or do you set T high to uh, lock or T low? Okay, so you, you ha absolutely have to lock the T low. Otherwise, if you guys change the rate, right. and so just, just yeah. use the rate. And I would tell you, if you're using the PB, it's actually, you just use the rate. Yeah. You know, so you can use a rate of 28, 30, it doesn't matter. As long as that T low is 75%, you're fine. Make it easy. But do you pick a T low based on? The, uh, the most common use point five. And yeah. then your blood gas, if you need to give it a higher uh, T low to eat CO2. To yeah. yeah, so let me just explain that a little bit, because that's a bit of a misconception. But you're, what we're talking about is there's this assumption that because the tidal volume is 500 instead of 400, that you're going to remove more carbon dioxide. And that's actually not true. The real question is how many molecules of carbon dioxide are in there? So could it be that 400 cc tidal volume has more carbon dioxide in it than 500? And let me explain why. If you remember, so, so your, your heart is constantly returning blood back to the lung. Your heart doesn't just stop and say, okay, they're between inhaling and exhaling, so let's hold here until we get, go in. No, your heart's constantly perfusing. So it's constantly returning CO2. CO2, that's its final destination is your lung, to be removed as a volatile gas, right? So if your airspace is more closed at uh, a longer T high with a bigger tidal volume, you're actually not going to diffuse CO2. In other words, it, it can't get into the airspace unless the airspace is open. So if you let the lung collapse because 75%, it's now 50%, your CO2 clearance is actually going to go down. So even though you've got a bigger volume, it has less molecules of CO2 in it. Because the surface area, I hope I'm making sense. Am I making any sense? Are you guys following that? Because it's, it's not an easy concept to explain, but, but the CO2 is, so the more open your lung is, the more the carbon dioxide can drift from the blood space into the alveolar space, right? So if half of my lung is doing this, then I'm going to decrease the efficiency. Why is my lung doing this? Because Someone increased the T low, and now I got more. I have more collapse, but the volume is bigger because you're letting out some of my FRC, that tidal volume. You're shrinking my lung down, to my lung volume down, right? And therefore, I'm going to have less efficient. So you're better off just increasing your P high. Your P high, if that's necessary, your T high. Don't touch the T low. I promise you. As long as the only thing I do know with right. reasonable certainty is you really need to stick that 75% if you're talking about a non-COPD patient. If it's, a, if it's a real COPD patient with low peak flow and all that, not sort of the chart COPD patient, then you, you adjust that differently. But those patients need 75 so don't go with all of And you know what? The, the lung is only willing to accept a smaller volume. Because there is data that suggests even 6 mLs can hurt the lung. It does not protect the lung uniformly. And that's, I would suspect, or my opinion, is because we're using a, a body weight number that doesn't correlate at all with how big your lung is in the disease state. So here the mechanics is telling you, hey, my lung is this small. This is all you're going to get. <coughs> and I, I promise you, sometimes it's a ridiculous kind of lung. So don't obsess about that. Think of that more as this is the, this is the kind of lung this lung is ready to give you. When that lung gets better, the tidal volumes will go up, I promise you. And then you can adjust your rate downwards if you're using the PP. So I've used a rate of 30, 33, whatever you need. As long as that T low is correct, somehow that lung recruits anyway. It's not just the T high. That does too. But somehow, I don't know, hopefully we'll figure it out. But, but I think, you know, uh, picking a T low of 0.5 is not necessarily the so you pick the 0.5 and then you just have to, you can freeze your screen and then you just look at your peak expiratory flow rate. The easiest way, we used to do it when, you know, you guys were there, we would look at where it terminated and then we would take that, divide it by, divide it by. But the easier way is to find your peak expiratory flow rate, take out your calculator, multiply that by 75. And once you do that, and I actually think I had a measure, I did a measurement in here on the ventilator just to show you that once you know what your goal is, then it's really easy. Yeah, right here. So if you 
find out your peak expiratory flow rate is 66, you multiply that by 75%, your target is 49. It may change by 1 to 2 liters per minute, very, very small. But basically, that's what you're looking for, is 49.5. So if you see here, we terminate at 53 liters per minute, which is... Sorry, it didn't come through. But it, we terminate at 53, which is about 70, I think, 6%. And uh, so if you take 53 uh, divided by um, uh, 66. So it's really, really close. Yeah. Or you can do what I do, which is cut, cut it in half. Cut the peak flow in half, and then cut it again. Right? So half is 50%, and half of that is 75%. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm cutting it in half here. And then I can say, oh, I'm going to cut it in half again. Right. I'll show you here. Right, <laughs> right there, that's the way. Yeah, there's your half. So there's half, and then, and then you cut it in half and half again. That's so like, then you take this, and you move it down half of that. Right? So that's why I can walk past and the room and say, So that's 75%. That's not See separate. how that lines up over here? So half of this half. Is 75 percent. I never measure. I mean, I just... No, but if you're having CO2 issues, yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, but, you... but you you have an, an advantage with your PVs over your servos, big advantage on the T load because on your servos you've got 0.5 or 0.6. There is nothing in between, and that's if. But on the PVs, you can do 0.5 to. And so you can get very intricate um, uh, yeah. and uh, So when you're not precise. breathing, the PB, I would tell you, is better than the servo. Because the, the T-low will keep <laughs> it automatically with the servo. It won't stay at whatever you set it. It's automatic. Yeah. And that's because of the trigger window. Uh, the problem with the PB is when the patient starts breathing. Now it's going to change the T-high and it's going to change the T-low. It's going to change the ratio automatically because it's trying to synchronize with the patient breathing. So that's when it gets crazy when the patient starts breathing. So I would just tell you, if the starts breathing and you've got the PB, it would be better than the servo, and I would just use the half in my opinion. Because then you don't have the hassle of the T low constantly changing and dancing around. Uh, because. Uh, well, they did study in China with PBs. They did. I mean, you can, you can use it. I'm just saying that what, the more the patient breathes, the more the ventilator is trying to chase the patient. Because it's not just done time cycle CPAP like on the trigger. It's just. You set the time, that's what you get. You set the T-load, that's what you get. It, it just lets the patient do what they want to do without trying to <laughs> change. Well, well, this is an inspiration, this is an expiration. So you'll see, I don't know if you guys have I'll seen it. Have you seen it? On the PB where the, the T-high and the T-load will just change. And same thing on the servo. The servo, again, this is all because that synchronization. So the problem is if you have unstable lung, you don't want that. So that platform is what's keeping the lung stable this balance between the P high, T high, and the T low. That's what's keeping your lung from a really Have unstable. This happen? This is, this is oh yeah. That side plays on its side. plays on its side. And you can see the patient takes a breath. There's the trigger right there. The he must. And then takes a breath. The volume's go up to 2.1 meters. Because it's just dumping it. What? You know, it's just like taking that T low way out. Servo does the same well, thing. And you can see it did it right here. Yeah. So see, see that little see, red just, dot? It'll do it automatically. That's the trigger. And then it increases. So look at the difference of the width. So it increases dramatically, and your volumes are 18. And you, you'll see the IE ratio just dance around all over the place. And that's just because it's trying to compensate for that spontaneous perfection. Yes. Just before. Yes. And because it's really, it's SIMV. Yeah. It's SIMV. Yeah. It's not really EPRV. Yeah. And here's the servo I does it too, though. Because this is SIMV pressure control. It's so. not a true. Any, any ventilator that has pressure support with their APRV is really the, you know, again, these guys didn't want to create a whole new mode. They just modified the controllers of pressure, SIMV pressure control. I promise you, I was on the phone with them. At least PB. So just be aware of this because, you know, honestly, in a sick lung, this will damage the lung. Not want that T load to sort of kick out because what you're doing is letting the lung collapse, and now that's the worst thing you can do. It's better to leave the lung collapsed and just ventilate this than to actually start ventilating the rest of recruiting the lung partially. 
That's worse. You're better off just not doing that at all. See these little hash marks? Those are your, you know, to denote one full second. So if your waveform fills the whole space and you're set at a T low point five, it's kicking out. Yeah, and the bottom with the volumes, they go for the leader. Because that's just kicking out all the the residual lung volume. It's not tidal volume. You're just letting that lung that wants to deflate go way down. And that's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to stabilize the lung, not stable than, than unstable and stable. That's really the worst thing to do lung. So just be careful. I, actually, the servo, I would tell you, is, is the worst ventilator. Uh, because, well, for, for APRV, and what I mean, what I mean by that is at least the beat, if you adjust the trigger, if you adjust the trigger, the, especially pressure, don't use a flow trigger, set the P trig to at least 10 or 20 on the pure Bennett, it, it will stop doing that. Yeah, And that's fine when your patient's not breathing, but you don't want a trigger that's impossible to trigger. So what I'm saying is that when on the on the servo, it doesn't matter. You can set the, pr the trigger to negative 20, and it'll still it'll sense a heartbeat, and pff, it'll kick out the T-low. So the PB, when the patient is not breathing, I would say superior to the um, servo. And then both of them are a disaster once they start breathing. <laughs> so, um, just to clarify for some, some of the RT, uh, can you go over uh, back to the other uh, image of the PB screen and talk a little bit about uh, your pressure uh, adjustment program? Yes, okay, sure. Uh, and uh, why and what's your theory of, uh, and, and, and how you set it? Right? Um, just to clarify for some of the RT. Yeah, so. so um, so uh, this is what you're talking about. Right. Sure. Yeah. So you know this depending on the and of course ventilator, some call it slow, some some create a delay, some are talking about how fast it should go up and Sorry, I'm gonna hang on a minute because I got a slide for that. Go ahead. So what I look for is I don't want that little antenna. Right? Because I, 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 I want to pressurize the lung as quickly as possible. Remember that the lung doesn't pressurize like that square box, right? So I don't want to delay that, right? Because I want to get to the distal airspace as quickly as possible. So if you create a long ramp, then you're, you're eating into that two seconds that you need. So you want to be more efficient. At the same time, if the because fl flow is what you're sort of, what you're, you're, tip, you're actually delaying the onset of the peak flow. Like most of these will, are delaying the onset, or you're saying, you know, use a percentage of the flow. So what you want is that flow to go up without causing a lot of back pressure. When you cause back pressure, you get these antennas here, right there. And so you don't want that because what I'd rather have is and actually you you get a little change in volume too. Right? Yeah. yeah. So you'll see that. So you can just fine tune it so you know that's the case. Now a lot of this has to do with intertracheal tube. You know how kinked it is, whether there's a lot of stuff in it. It changes the velocity of the gas. Because the velocity we don't really understand because the dynamics of the tube. So you just adjust it down. That's how I do it. I would say suction first. Make sure, you know, because some of that goes away. So if yep. you suction and it doesn't go away, then you just slowly, and it, for the PB, you're going to increase it in percentage. So you'll go from 50 to 55 percent. Yeah, okay, everyone you know. uses 50. Generally, yeah, I'd say 50 is not enough. 80 is generally too high. Yeah. So I well, yeah, or if you have the spike come down. Most people are like 60, 70. I just wanted to clarify, because it's different. I just want you to clarify yeah. your theory coming from you. So it could be... Uh, yeah, maybe I mean, different. to be honest with you, this whole thing came from the Servo 900. And the Servo 900, has anyone ever worked on that? That's the one that you open the top. Yeah, yeah, yep. it's got yes, the scissors it's valve. The awesome. yep. So if you remember that ventilator, it, it, so it was really a good ventilator because most of the ventilators in that era, the, the PSI off the wall would drop way down and the patients would try to suck air out of it and the ventilator would be empty halfway through the breath. You know, they wouldn't get any gas. So what they did was they figured out, well, we'll put, we'll put a, like a, a tidal volume on in this bellows on some springs so the the wall fills the bellows, the patient takes the breath, and while the patient's taking the breath, we can fill the bellows. So we're like one breath ahead of the patient. So it was actually pretty clever at the time. And the springs allowed the gas to come out of there very quickly. So no ventilator could actually do real sort of square wave pressure control. 
So even on the ventilator, the pressure control was very, it's kind of like the VIA, because the VIA is an old bare ventilator. You see that little bend in it? See that little, in the airway pressure, little gap there? It, so most of the ventilators that can't deliver gas well do that, and that's one of them, by the way. So the problem was when the patient got better, and so to keep that, all those springs, because you crank up the springs, they were under a lot of tension. I mean, they were like really ferocious springs here. So, but they would go through a little tiny opening, which had a little scissors valve, which was fine because this is the patient. So you're going, and you're pushing gas through the patient. Now the problem was when the patient got better, so here's your patient, and now they're trying to breathe. It was really hard to suck through this thing. So because of that ventilator, pressure support was invented to push a little through here. It was actually invented to overcome that problem with that ventilator. And uh, the same thing with the slope, the slope, because now that they added pressure, it, the springs overshot, you know, because they're like a jerky movement, and so it would feel, it would startle the patient. So what they did was they tried to slow down the onset of that flow. So that's where rise came from. Everything goes to that ventilator was good for the non-breathing patient, but terrible for the breathing patient. And so they had to make those modifications. But, but so, I think so that's why you have rise time. Yeah. Mainly for those patients that are spontaneously breathing. In this setting, what we're doing is just trying to finesse the flow pattern. And I think to answer your question about the rationale, which is you don't see on the AVIA, you have no control over this. Correct. It will not, you cannot adjust rise time. You have zero control over it. So the philosophy would be don't delay on someone who has a sick lung. You want to repressurize that lung as soon as possible, not take your sweet time. Where when they get better, of course, you do, they don't want that, you know, that big impact. Because we want to reach the alveolar's compartment before the breath terminates. So if you create a lag, that, that you're sort of slowing down that point where things equilibrate between the distal airspace and the proximal. And as compliance improves, you may adjust your lifestyle. Yes. So I'm going to just continue to uh, put some sort of question scenario. Yeah, sure. You, um, just I just don't want to take on, ex on experience. So let's say um, a patient that you know, just comes in with septic, becomes uh, an ARDS patient, you put them on uh, APRD. Over time, uh, cause F ALI, that barrel trial patient spontaneously gets a new one. What is your procedure with a patient on APRD? And you got patients desaturated, and just jumping all over. What is your procedure on a patient that's having a spontaneous thing that's not treated at that time? What will you do for them? What is your procedure? Like, thoughts and theories? Do you remove them from APRV and try to just both ventilate to sustain, just to continue ventilation since the pressure may cause uh, more severe pneumonia? Are you going to a mode that has no pressure? Low pressure? No pressure. So well, the pressure in APRV. I just want to say, like, well, what's your theory? Do you <laughs> continue being APRV? Well, what I'm saying, well, I guess what I'm saying is you're using pressure regardless. Correct. So remember, the pressure in APRV is not more magical or less magical than any other mode. So, so and pneumothoraces really shouldn't be treated any different. If it needs a tube, it needs a tube. Let's say we're not treating it yet, though. It's just like, it's just well, is there something wrong with the patient? Night, and then the patient's desaturating. Why not? He's subcute, Are has pneumo. Do we just, do, do we decrease the time just to kind of both ventilate instead of having a rate of 10, let's put on a rate of 16? Or do you just automatically take them off the APRV and put them on pressure control until the situation is handled? Either one of the surgeons comes no, in. No, I don't. I don't. And I'm, I'm not sure I understand the logic of doing that. So remember that, you know, after you give that pressure, you're holding the pressure, there's no more airflow, right? Like, I mean, you know, you know the initial triangle of a pressure mode? There's no more flow after that. In it's not like we're adding volume. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're stopping, you stop the dynamic component, and now you're just using a static component. And so you have to decide, I'm gonna assume that the ventilator's set correctly, there's no problem with the ventilator kicking out during all these other crazy things. Well, yeah. The settings are not correct. Like, do well, if the just, settings are correct, you, do know, you have to still say, adjust the settings and continue what we're doing. Or that's what I'm talking about. If the about, settings are correct, area. and then the patient gets a new mode, 
I would use the same settings you were before. I wouldn't modify them. If the settings are not correct, the, 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 not correct well, the new mod has nothing to do with right. the incorrect settings or correct settings. Well, let's say it's getting too much pressure, too much volume. How do you know that? Let's say the patient is getting a pressure of 30 and the patient is getting consistent with value. So let me ask you Oh, I, I, I can tell you right there. If your pressure is 30 and you're getting volumes of 1,000, your TLO is kicking yeah, out. Yeah, there's something It has like nothing that. to do. And that's and what hurts the law. It is the best. So that's that gray area that I kind of want to do. Okay, let me see if I can help you a little bit. But, but that's what well, we let, just showed you. Yeah, that's what happened. Now, now I understand. What, so let me just explain that a little bit. So let me just tell you guys something. Uh, uh, all the studies that have been done, take every single ArchNet study, take the alveoli study, take the, uh, the latest ARC trial, take the uh, OSCAR trial, the oscillate trial, every single study where you compare low tidal volume or high tidal volume. Which group do you think had a higher baritrone? The 12 mLs or the 6? 12? 6. The 6. No difference. The high peak, low peak, who had a higher baritone rate? Hmm? No difference. The uh, oscillator versus the low tidal volume group, 6 ml, which group had a higher baritone rate? No difference. The Oscar trial, no difference. In fact, if you look at what causes a pneumothorax on the ventilator, it has nothing to do with the ventilator settings. Nothing correlates with pneumothorax. Tidal volumes of 20 ml. What matters is the lung ear ventilator. So there's actually a paper that looked at 5,000 patients looking at who developed, you know, you know, take the parameters, high people, low people, whatever, and who got baritone. There was no relationship. The only thing that, that was related was how bad the lung is, the worse the lung is. Now, let's, let's now forward, fast forward to um, the driving pressure data. The driving pressure data took a lot of the uh, studies I just mentioned it took me nine studies, 3,900 um, patients, 3,000 data points. And they just asked the question, what is the role of driving pressure, which is, you know, delta P. But it's really, you know what driving pressure really is? You take the compliance of the lung, uh, the tidal volume of the lung divided by compliance. In other words, it's a normalization of a lung's compliance to the appropriate tidal volume. Because the smaller the tidal volume. So that's the only thing that correlates with survival is the driving pressure. They found that tidal volumes didn't matter. They found that plateau pressures didn't matter. They found this is the original ArchNet data. They found that the only thing that did matter in terms of outcome was driving pressure more than 13. And what correlated with barotrauma was driving pressure. Now what is driving pressure? It's the delta P. And I can tell you experimentally when that T low kicks out, you've got a big delta. That's what you try to get rid of dynamic strain. Dynamic strain is when you're taking the lung from here and moving it to here. Static strain is what APRB does. After that initial, it's just holding it. There's less energy when you do that. Less energy. I know this because I got punched in the face by a famous doctor named uh, Luciano Gattoni, who I had actually worked with before, so I knew him. So, but he was telling me about a paper he's about to publish, which is you know a paper about energy. And so he was trying to describe to me his latest research. We were in Pittsburgh, and he goes, you know, he speaks an uh, accent. So he goes to me, well, you know, I can punch you in the face once and hold my fist, right? So the energy transfer is just once. I'm just holding my fist, right? Nothing happened. But this is where the problem is if I keep doing this. So you keep doing this, and I'm asking you just do this. That's where you get baritone, is this. That's why I tell you, you don't use, if you use that T low, of 25%, what you're doing is allowing the lung to de-recruit, and because APRB is very good at recruiting, it's a very lethal mode if you have not control that T low. Right? You need to keep that lung just bouncing around right here. You don't want it to go from this extreme to that extreme. But you're better off leaving the lung to de-recruit. Just to okay. comment on taking them off of APRB to, you know, to, to change things, just remember, you have to try to match that mean airway pressure. Right, and right, that's extremely right. difficult. So what's going to happen? You're going to de-recruit the lung, and if you have a pneumothorax, what comes with it? You're going to make the pneuma worse, right? Because yeah. when you collapse the lung, you pull, right? It, it's going to it's going to make the pneuma worse. You're going to need even more airway pressure. Yeah. Best thing for a pneumo is to recruit the lung. So that's so the there. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.